we will start now. Uh, good afternoon to all, and let you let me welcome you to the CMS Sri Lanka National Management Accounting Conference 2021-2021. The technical session one. It's day one today, and uh, uh, we are having our first session on solutions to overcome external debt problems and critical economic issues. Now, yesterday we had the inauguration. I think it was a very, very uh, successful inauguration with the uh, uh, governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ajit Kumar Cabral, and uh, Mr. Alan Johnson, the president of the International Federation of Accountants, and uh, our guest speaker, Professor Ho Yuki from uh, Singapore. I think all of them spoke on very, very important topics. And uh, I think CMA Sri Lanka are very proud that we had the uh, president of the International Federation of Accountants and uh, uh, the comments that he made and also our association uh, with the International Federation of Accountants, which is the global body uh, for the accounting profession really, uh, I think uh, put us on top. And we are very happy that as a national uh, uh, professional management accounting body in Sri Lanka that uh, we've also received uh, that great recognition. Then of course, uh, the uh, governor spoke on the uh, topic on the revival of Sri Lankan economy, uh, COVID-19 and beyond. He spoke on the various opportunities that are available, the gaps that are there, and uh, how uh, also the professional accountants uh, could get together to help uh, in the reviving of the economy and helping build uh, the economy. Of course, uh, the problems of the, uh, the exchange control, the other restrictions that are there, I think these are topics that we will be uh, discussing today, but uh, uh, he is very hopeful and I think planning to come up, uh, he's announced his plans on 1st October and he spoke quite a lot on the SME sector, uh, they are role and also how they can help in the economy of this country. So that's also a good area because currently the CMA Sri Lanka COVID-19 SMA Development Committee is really doing a great deal. And uh, also the uh, approval of the credit guarantee institution where the government is now going ahead to provide the much needed guarantee uh, where people who do not have collateral for getting loans for the SME sector. So uh, these were the things and of course, uh, uh, Professor Ho Yu Ki to, uh, spoke on the reviving the economy post-COVID, the case of Singapore. And as you all know, everyone is speaking of Singapore, but they do not know uh, the trouble that they have taken, the discipline that they have enforced, and uh, of course, uh, getting rid of, rid of, uh, rid of corruption, wastage, uh, and of course, increasing the productivity. Now, uh, these are things that are very important. I think even the governor also mentioned on that and also how the accountants could play a role. So today we have the uh, uh, a very, very experienced, uh, eminent, and of course, uh, very knowledgeable uh, uh, speakers with us uh, 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 who are going to speak on the current uh, debt problems and solutions, Professor uh, Sirimo and Kolomake. Then we have the external debt management and critical economic issues is IMF and alternative, uh, Dr. W. A. Vijayvodhna, and uh, of course, the challenges and opportunities for the private sector where uh, Shiran Fernando is there from the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. So I'm very happy to have with, uh, uh, in our panel, uh, Mr. Manil Jaisingha, the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka. He's also a council member on uh, CMA Sri Lanka as my uh, co-chairman, and I'm very happy that uh, he uh, will be able to uh, assist me, and also uh, he will play the more important role of uh, uh, getting the questions, uh, the, the Q&A, uh, where uh, all our uh, participants could send uh, their questions on the Q&A. Please send it on Q&A because uh, uh, that is very easy to follow uh, so that then uh, we will not miss any of your questions. So please do so and uh, that we will be able to take it. I'll just give a brief introduction of our uh, eminent people who are uh, gathered here. Of course, uh, Mr. Manil Jaisingha, the co-chairman of our committee, is a fellow member of uh, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka, as I said, is the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka, a fellow member of CMA, and he also serves on as a member of the Board of International Accounting Standards, Education Standards Board of International Federation of Accountants. Uh, 
that is what uh, uh, Mr. Alan Johnson, who was present there yesterday, was uh, is the president of that association. He's also a member of the board of Sri Lanka Accounting and Auditing Standards Board, uh, chairman of the Accounting Standards Committee of uh, SAFA, uh, consultant to various big committees, and of course, he's a senior partner of uh, Ernest and Young. So I think he was appointed recently. Our congratulations and best wishes to Mani. Then, of course, on our speakers list, as I said, we have very, very uh, eminent people. Of course, Professor Sirimo and Kolomavige, who is here. Uh, he's Emeritus Professor of Economics, the Open University of Sri Lanka, graduated from University of Peradeniya with first class honors in economics. And, uh, of course, the specialized fields of macroeconomic uh, economic monetary theory, uh, econometric and modeling. But, uh, as you know, he is also a former director of statistics of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. So I think uh, a lot of the things that we said will have direct rela relation to the economy and as to how uh, maybe Governor Cabral is going to give the solutions to this. Then the next, uh, uh, we have Dr. Vijay Wadna, of course, uh, Dr. Vijay Wadna is uh, uh, someone very well known to all of you, a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, an educationist, a writer, columnist, and public speaker engaging himself in education management. He functions as the president of the Business Management School, or BMS, a government approved non-state sector university in Sri Lanka and serves on the faculty boards of both the University of Sri Jayawardenepura and uh, post PIM. So he's uh, very well involved in this and also an adjunct uh, faculty at the Thailand-based Asian Institute of Technology and visiting lecturer in both the University of Sri Jayawardenepura and the PIM. So uh, I know that uh, we are uh, we are all waiting to listen to him. And uh, then, of course, uh, from the private sector side, I'm very happy that uh, Mr. Shiran Fernando is here, who is the chief economist of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and leads the Economic Intelligence Unit, which is the focal point of the Chamber for Economic Research and Policy Advocacy. He's engaged in providing policy level support to the government to shape the national economic agenda in his capacity as the chief economist of the CCC, he is part of several steering committees formed by government to drive forward the economic growth. So I think uh, uh, with that uh, short introduction, I have uh, uh, much pleasure in inviting uh, uh, Professor Sirimaman Kolamwage, the Emeritus Professor Open University of Sri Lanka and former Director of Statistics of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka to speak uh, on the topic that is allocated to him on the current external debt problems and solutions. Over to Dr. Professor Siriman Kolomi. Professor, you're on mute, Professor. Me? <clears throat> ah, Professor, Professor Kolomi. Okay, right. Can can you hear me now? Yes, yes, fine, fine. We can hear. All right, thank you. I'll start again. Thank you, Professor Lakshman Matavala, President of CMA, Mr. Manil Jaisingha, co-chairman of this session, distinguished uh, panelists and participants. I would like to thank uh, Professor Matavala for inviting me to share my thoughts on this uh, timely topic. Of course, this is a controversial topic somewhat and Sri Lanka is facing many challenges at the moment. So I think uh, it's a uh, high time to discuss this. And also I am very much pleased to see my former colleague and long time friend, Dr. W. A. Vijay Vardhan on this panel. In fact, we work together a long time in the International Finance Division of the Economic Research Department of the Central Bank. So this uh, topic is somewhat uh, common to both of us. Now, uh, the topic uh, given to me is uh, current external problems and solutions. Now, we, we must first uh, ascertain whether there is a debt problem because there are there is a different school of thought which believes that Sri Lanka doesn't face any external debt problem at the moment. Uh, in particular, the governor of the central bank, Mr. Ajit Nivad Kabral, at a webinar held last week, uh, uh, totally rejected the idea that uh, Sri Lanka has, uh, has an external debt problem. He said that uh, all repayments have been made promptly. 
of course, we must appreciate the fact that Sri Lanka is one country that has honored the external debt in spite of all the difficulties during the since independence, I must say. So I think uh, that's uh, somewhat uh, we can, that is something that we can be happy, but that should not be a reason for, uh, I mean, uh, to be so happy because we are facing some challenges at the moment. Uh, as uh, Professor Patawala mentioned, the governor of the central bank is going to present a roadmap uh, indicating the future agenda of the government uh, uh, regarding these uh, problems. So uh, we must uh, first, as I mentioned earlier, we must first ascertain whether there is a debt problem. Usually a country's uh, debt can be uh, gauged by using two benchmarks. These are the benchmarks used, the, used by the World Bank and the IMF uh, in their debt sustainability assessments. So there are two uh, basic uh, benchmarks. One is uh, solvency, that is uh, gross public debt as a percentage of the country's GDP. And the second uh, you know, threshold is liquidity, which means that debt service payments on long-term public debt and public guaranteed debt as a percentage of government revenue. Here we can particularly focus on the external debt service payments on, uh, on the foreign debt. So as regards the first uh, criteria, that is solvency, gross, domestic, gross public debt as a percentage of GDP, we all know that uh, our GDP, public debt to GDP ratio is uh, fairly high. Last year it was 101% uh, of GDP, and this year it's going to be uh, more than that, maybe close to 108% of GDP. And uh, in terms of the debt sustainability assessment uh, criteria of the World Bank and the IMF, the threshold, uh, threshold uh, is uh, around 55% of GDP. That means if a country exceeds this uh, threshold, that means the country has uh, debt sustainability problems. So as we can see that uh, Sri Lanka's uh, uh, gross domestic debt to GDP ratio is 101. So there's a difference of around 46 percentage points. So this is uh, Sri Lanka is far above the threshold. And so this indicates a kind of uh, insolvency. So that is uh, uh, with regard to the first uh, criteria. The second criteria is, uh, as I mentioned, liquidity, that is debt service payments on long term public debt and public guaranteed debt as a percentage of uh, revenue. Now, uh, when we consider the Sri Lanka situation, uh, Sri Lanka, Sri, uh, the Sri Lanka's external debt payments, that is foreign debt payments, as a percentage of government revenue is as much as 64%. So in other words, the government uh, has to allocate around 40% of its total revenue just to make uh, annual service payments for foreign debt alone. And uh, globally, the threshold uh, decided by the IMF and the World Bank, according to DSA, its uh, sustainable assessment is around 23% of government revenue. So which means that uh, Sri Lankan government has a higher debt service to external debt service to government revenue, which is around 64%. So the difference is about uh, 40 to 41 percentage points. Uh, so in terms of these two indicators, we can see that uh, the central uh, the government uh, is facing problems. The government is facing a challenge with regard to external debt. But we should not be too pessimistic about these things uh, because the uh, countries have overcome many several countries, particularly in Latin American region. Uh, many countries, developing countries have overcome uh, debt uh, service problems. So this is, uh, this is of, our, of course, a matter of concern, but uh, there are ways and means. I hope Dr. Vijay Vardana will uh, uh, explain the debt management 
uh, criteria in the in his presentation so uh, I must say that uh, the problem in Sri Lanka is compounded by the fact that uh, uh, that uh, foreign debt is foreign debt accounts for around 40 percent of the total debt debt that means foreign debt is around 40 percent and the balance 60 percent is uh, domestic debt so fairly high uh, domestic uh, fairly high uh, foreign debt component is there and also we must uh, consider the fact that uh, commercial borrow borrowings alone account for about uh, total uh, commercial borrowings account for 60 percent of our total foreign debt so that is fairly high for since Sri Lanka is uh, uh, you know in the upper middle close to upper middle income range uh, we are not eligible Sri Lanka is not eligible to concessional loans as in the past so we the government has to depend on commercial loans. Uh, so in terms of uh, the solvency and liquidity benchmarks that I mentioned earlier, Sri Lanka is ranked as an extremely speculative and substantial risk. Extremely uh, speculative and substantial risk category. Along with uh, seven other countries, those countries are Angola, the Congo, uh, Congo DRC, Gabon, Laos, Mali, and Mozambique. So Sri Lanka has almost uh, reached uh, the close to, I would say, next line of, of our default. In other words, Sri Lanka is now getting closer to default imminent category. That is the term that is used by DSA. And also, with, there are so many other indicators that we can uh, use to assess the gravity of the debt problem. For instance, uh, debt service payments uh, that the country has to meet, met, uh, and come, the country has to meet in the next 12 months is around 7 billion US dollars. And uh, we, the country, the central bank has only about uh, 3 billion US dollars. So there's a balance of a deficit of uh, 4 billion. And also at the same time, the banking system has to meet uh, import payments and various other uh, commitments apart from uh, debt service payments. So in other words, debt service payments are two and a half times of uh, the country's reserves. And uh, foreign debt service payments are around 60% of our export earnings and uh, almost all worker remittances uh, uh, are absorbed by the debt service payments. Debt worker remittances uh, amount to about uh, say six to seven billion US dollars, even that is coming down. So our debt service, annual debt service payments is uh, seven billion US dollars. So you can see that uh, our entire uh, worker remittances uh, is eaten by uh, debt service payments. So it is clear that uh, Sri Lanka is facing an external debt uh, problem. I wouldn't say it's a crisis, but it is getting closer to a, a crisis. And also there are, there are other ways of uh, measuring or gauging the debt problem in a particular country. One way of uh, assessing debt uh, is debt dynamics which uh, means that the difference between interest rate and the economic growth rate, GDP growth rate, as you know that uh, interest rate payments in the uh, foreign global capital markets are going up and uh, with the downgrading of uh, Sri Lanka's uh, credit rating rates, uh, uh, the government finds it difficult to uh, mobilize borrowings from abroad and the government has to pay a higher uh, interest rate, say around seven to eight percent for international sovereign bonds. So that is one problem. And at the same time, uh, as we know that uh, Sri Lanka is facing uh, uh, problems, uh, or Sri Lanka's growth rate is hit by COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, it's a uh, even before the pandemic, the GDP growth rate was coming down to around 3% of GDP due to various capacity uh, problems. So now 
we are experiencing a negative growth as in the case of uh, many other countries due to the due to the pandemic so this is another matter for concern that uh, interest payments and in, you know growth interest interest rate growth differential which is uh, going to be somewhat higher so the higher the differential the lower the debt sustainability of a particular Professor, you are muted. Professor, you are muted. I'm sorry. Again, again. Uh, sorry. Okay, okay. Fine, fine. Okay. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, fine. fine. Right. One problem of this uh, interest growth, the interest rate differential is that uh, investment uh, debt based in infrastructure, invest debt based infrastructure investments uh, carried out in the past did not carry. Did not generate enough. Uh, did not generate sufficient uh, uh, export earnings or sufficient uh, income or production to cover the interest payments that we are facing now. So, there, in other words, there is a low rate of return. I think that, as uh, Professor Watwala mentioned yesterday, the management accountant can play a major role in this uh, field as regards. Uh, the rate of return of investments. Then uh, I would like to briefly consider the causes of this external debt problem. I would say that the main problem is uh, that the country is facing twin deficits. One is fiscal deficit and the other is the balance of payments. This is called uh, twin deficits in, uh, in economics. In fact, one deficit is a mirror, mirror image of the other deficit. So as regards fiscal deficits, uh, that we, we are having a fiscal deficit of around 12% uh, of GDP last year, mainly due to tax cuts implemented uh, since uh, 2020. And uh, so fiscal imbalances, imbalance is compounded by the heavy debt payments that uh, the government is uh, uh, committed. And, uh, and also the total debt service payments, including uh, domestic and foreign debt, it's around 141% uh, of GDP. So it's quite high. In other words, the government, uh, the government revenue is insufficient to finance the total debt service payments annually. Total debt service payments to the revenue ratio is 141%. Then secondly, the balance of payments deficit, there is a widening trade deficit and the tourist earnings have come down due to the pandemic and also worker remittances are also uh, coming down due to exchange rate disparities. And also, we you know, the export sector is hit by the pandemic. And of course, we must uh, recognize that the export, uh, it is encouraging to see that the export, uh, export sector is recovering uh, this year onwards. So this, these are the, uh, causes of uh, the external debt problem that we face. So Sri Lanka's future debt sustainability is uh, quite challenging, I would say. What do we mean by debt sustainability? In general, a country's public debt is considered sustainable if the government is able to meet all its current and future payment obligations without exceptional financial assistance or going into default. So uh, this is the uh, you know, situation that uh, Sri Lanka is facing today. So how to overcome this then uh, we have to discuss. So Sri Lanka's uh, external debt sustainability is likely to weaken further for several reasons. One reason is that, as I mentioned earlier, due to the, due to the weak uh, credit worthiness of the country, interest rates are going up, uh, interest rates or yield rates on uh, international sovereign bonds are going up. And uh, yes, uh, investors consider the country's uh, uh, credit worthiness. And also, secondly, there is a problem of exchange rate depreciation. Now, that will have a tremendous impact on the government debt service burden. As the currency depreciates, the rupee depreciates, the government will have to pump more and more rupee, uh, rupees to, uh, to pay the debt. So these are the challenges and the picture is not so uh, you know, bright. Uh, 
uh, we have to face this uh, somehow. So, but we should not be so pessimistic as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the country can overcome these problems uh, with the concrete uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, framework. Uh, since uh, Dr. Vijayvadan is going to discuss uh, the external debt management and uh, how, the, uh, how the IMF can help the country in resolving the debt problem, I would uh, briefly flag uh, some of the uh, solutions that we can think of at the moment. Uh, we can divide, uh, we can identify these uh, solutions as short term and long term, medium and long term. In the short term, I think it is essential to uh, praise uh, tax, taxes, tax revenue. As I mentioned earlier, the tax revenue has uh, come down as a result of the tax cuts implemented by, the, by this government last year. And uh, uh, government revenue to GDP ratio has come down to less than 10%, as uh, was mentioned at the last, yesterday's inauguration by uh, some distinguished uh, uh, delegates. So that is on the ex uh, tax side and expenditure side, uh, uh, we can't see any rationalization of the expenditure of the government at the moment. Particularly, it is uh, reported in yesterday's paper papers that the government is going to allocate uh, huge uh, amounts of uh, you know investment uh, funding for to ministries, departments, and other government entities. You know. Uh, with regard to, as we know, the election, local level elections are due to be held next uh, year. So I think uh, development uh, uh, committees are to be allocated some kind of uh, investment uh, allocation from the government funds. So at the yesterday's, yesterday, in yesterday's uh, presidential address, uh, Professor Lakshman Watawala emphasized the need to have expenditure controls with regard to the ministries, departments, and other government entities. I think that is very important because uh, unlike in the private sector, the government entities are not uh, accountable and not transparent. So this is uh, one major problem that the government is facing, not only the present government, but successive governments. So as a result, government expenditure has, uh, you know, expanded exponentially, whereas the revenue side is uh, somewhat uh, stagnant or going down. So I think it is important to rationalize and uh, prune unnecessary expenditure with the help of uh, the management uh, accountants. And also, uh, we can uh, suggest that uh, it is or we can propose, or we can think about the IMF uh, assistance at this moment. I think it is the right thing to do, but uh, the government and the central bank governor have, have different views on this issue, because uh, unless uh, the advantage of, uh, there are several advantages in going to the IMF. One major advantage is that uh, when we go to the IMF, the IMF will look at the entire economy and they will in consultation with the local experts from the Ministry of Finance, uh, Central Bank and other ministries, we can have a proper macroeconomic uh, framework for the next uh, coming years. So that is one advantage and also, uh, you know, obtaining a standby loan or some other assistance from the IMF is a seal given to the country that the country's uh, uh, Credit worthiness is uh, strong and it has, a, it has a prepayment capacity. So that might be one option. And also another option is the debt restructuring in consultation with the uh, creditors. So those are the short term uh, solutions very briefly. Uh, finally, I would like to say something about the medium term and long term framework. I think it is important to have uh, clear macroeconomic framework uh, with the IMF or without, without the IMF. In the past, in the 1970s and 80s, in fact, I worked in the Ministry of Finance uh, uh, during those years. Uh, 
uh, there was a consistent uh, plan and uh, each and every ministry can't uh, have uh, their own uh, expenditure plans. It has to go through central mechanism. I wouldn't say that it, there, it should not be dictated by a particular ministry, but that kind of uh, formality, that kind of uh, consistency is uh, necessary. So it is very necessary to have an integrated macroeconomic framework. Otherwise, when you, when you as, as in the present case, if you isolate the exchange rate and it, if the central bank try, attempts to stabilize it, then various other problems will erupt. And if the central bank attempts to control the money supply alone or to control interest rates alone, then the exchange rate will destabilize. So it is necessary to have a holistic uh, framework that is very important and this is where we can seek assistance from the IMF World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. I think Professor Watala has long experience in these areas. Then secondly, I would say that the medium and long-term uh, government should have a fiscal discipline, clear fiscal discipline. In 2003, the, the then government uh, approved the Fiscal Management Responsibility Act in now, uh, 2003, I suppose. And uh, accordingly, the government uh, had to maintain certain fiscal targets, budget deficit, revenue targets, and expenditure targets. Now it is abandoned. And uh, recently, the government uh, has uh, postponed the fiscal targets to 2030. So I would say that uh, fiscal targets are transferred to the next generation. Then uh, also, it is important to have central bank independence. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it should be total independent body, but it should work in, consult, in collaboration with the government, but uh, the central bank needs some kind of autonomy. Currently, the central bank is compelled to finance budget deficit, and we have we heard about uh, money printing during the last couple of uh, weeks so much. So it is necessary to have a kind of uh, uh, monetary management framework, independent monetary management framework. And uh, around three years ago, the central bank and the finance minister and the, and the finance ministry with the blessings of the late uh, finance minister, Mr. Mangal Samarvira, the central bank uh, and the finance minister and finance ministry uh, formulated an inter inflation targeting monetary policy framework. So that's the kind of uh, thing that we need uh, in line with the fiscal discipline. So fiscal discipline and central bank independence are quite important in addressing these problems in the medium, medium and long term. And also it is, there's a need to reduce uh, commercial borrowings and strict uh, project evaluation needs to be followed uh, in raising project loans. In the past, I think uh, some of the projects or most of the projects, I would say that uh, strict uh, project evaluation criteria were not uh, followed. So again, I think uh, the management accountants have a role to, have a role to play in uh, adhering strict uh, project evaluation. Then uh, also we can think of export promotion in the long run, high value added, high tech exports are necessary. And also it is necessary to link the country with the global value chains. So I think the government needs to assist the exporters in these areas. And also finally, I would like to say that uh, trade liberalization is a must. Currently, there are so many import restrictions are in force. Of course, we can't blame the central bank or the government. Given the foreign exchange shortages, that uh, it is necessary to have that kind of import uh, controls and exchange controls. But in the long run, I think this should be uh, phased out. Uh, this should be phased out uh, for the benefit of the export sector. That is how we can we can uh, achieve export-led growth and to ease our debt external debt service uh, problem. So with these uh, words, I would like to close this uh, present presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Walter. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Siriman Kolombage. I think uh, you have really gone into all the details and we as accountants are 
really now wondering because we are looking at company balance sheets and other areas, but have never looked at the government balance sheet. I think uh, our accountants should now look more closely at government balance sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Because you see, now if a company has a solvency problem, if it has a liquidity problem, I think all our uh, uh, accountants, financial accountants, management accountants, auditors, they are all highly worried, you know. So I think what you gave is really a very, very important, uh, maybe especially for the accountants. I don't think anyone, they are only thinking of their private person. That's not the case. You know, I think uh, we need to now strongly look at the government side. And I think what you said was really, I think uh, for us, uh, it seems to be a very, very, uh, maybe a very difficult situation that we are in. The very matters that you mentioned are all relevant all in our uh, accounting uh, I think these are all there, whether it is a evaluation of a project or whether it is the cash flow or the liquidity, the debt payment, all those are already there. But unfortunately, they are only concentrating on the private sector. As I said yesterday, government needs to recruit more qualified accountants if they are to solve this problem. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Sriman Kolomami. I think you have uh, spoken. Uh, laid down the stage for what uh, uh, Dr. Vijayvodhani is going to speak, external debt management and critical issues is IMF and alternative. So as I said earlier, Dr. W. Vijayvodhana, a member of the Board of Studies of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Sri Jayavardhanapura, and former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Over to you, Dr. Vijayvodhana. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Watawal. And indeed, I think uh, it was a privilege for me to speak after my good friend, uh, Professor Kolobage, uh, because uh, some time back, uh, the late Mr. Laksman Kadirgama, addressing the Oxfordian, said he was a different species because he was a cake baked at home. I can say that Professor Kolobage is a cake baked at the central bank because he had we worked in the central bank in almost all the areas of the central bank, public debt and data processing, statistics, economic research. So therefore, he's a man who knows ABC up to from A to Z of the central banking and economic uh, data management. And therefore, it was a pleasure to listen to him today. The topic, uh, my topic is, uh, you know, made uh, very much easier by Professor Kolumbage because uh, he had actively placed before us the basic and the very complex issues faced by the uh, by uh, Sri Lanka today, with respect to its uh, foreign debt, uh, its respect to its uh, economic growth, with respect to its government budget management, and so forth. So I will therefore concentrate uh, my presentation only on whether Sri Lanka should uh, go to IMF and uh, whether there are other alternatives available for Sri Lanka to do this. Now, presently, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, economic uh, system, if you look at uh, it's faced with a number of problems, it has mounting external debt problem, uh, continuing BOP deficit low and falling reserve, uh, pressure for exchange rate to fall. The sum total of this is that the, all the rating agencies have downgraded Sri Lanka. Then um, there's an additional development which has been faced by Sri Lanka today because the international sovereign bonds issued by Sri Lanka, they are traded in the secondary market at a deep discount with a very high yield rates. Therefore, it has actually closed the door for Sri Lanka to tap this particular market in order to raise additional funds. So uh, we are in a great uh, difficulty. And uh, what the government has done is it has actually, instead of addressing the issues uh, at the root, which had been described to us by Professor Kolombage, it had tried to introduce some short-term palliative, thinking that those short-term palliatives will do the job. Now, one such value is to get these soft facilities from friendly countries. Uh, three countries have been tapped for this purpose, India, Bangladesh, and China. Then they have resorted to import and exchange restriction. Along with that, they have resorted to the uh, mandatory uh, export proceed repatriation by the exporters. And in fact, uh, uh, they had been warned uh, yesterday by the central bank in a special press release that uh, they should bring their export proceed promptly. Otherwise, uh, they will be branded as uh, traitors to Sri Lanka. Then uh, they have done another palliative, fixing the exchange rate at a fixed rate so that the uh, dollars uh, you know, are available only at a fixed rate according to Central Bank. 
at 203 rupees per US dollar for buyers and 197 rupees for uh, 223 for sellers of dollars and 197 for buyers of dollars. But uh, dollars are not available in the formal foreign exchange market at these rates. So they are traded at, uh, at the black market at a very uh, high rate uh, with a high uh, premium. Then uh, repatriation requirements have been enforced. And those are short-term palliatives, which the government has introduced instead of uh, treating the ailment faced by Sri Lanka at its root and rather than uh, treating the symptoms. So this is where uh, we have to look at, you know, what we have to do. So the recommendation by all the experts who know, including my good friend, uh, Professor Kolabage, and also all the panelists who participate in the webinar hosted by the International Chamber of Commerce at which Governor Cabral spoke, uh, recommendation was that Sri Lanka should seek uh, assistance from the IMF. And this was actually very uh, cogently presented to the Minister of Finance by uh, the private sector in Sri Lanka, including some economists, that Sri Lanka should go to IMF. And if Sri Lanka doesn't go to IMF, Sri Lanka should come up with its uh, alternate economic plan very clearly. Then uh, the response of the uh, of the government was that uh, IMF is not the solution. I mean, the top policy leaders of the government from time to time pronounced in public as well as in various uh, writings they have made and also interviews that they have given to media that IMF is not the solution and they have a different kind of a solution based on their own uh, economic thinking. And uh, as a result, the IMF has been kept away from uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a problem solving agency by Sri Lanka for quite for some time now. Then uh, the main reason why uh, they don't want to uh, go to IMF is one is that the IMF loans are released in, uh, in tranches, in installments, uh, not the uh, full amount uh, uh, released upfront by the, uh, by the lender. Now, for example, if you borrow from China or borrow from some other country, the full uh, proceeds of the facility will be received by the government upfront, and therefore, uh, they immediately they get a budgetary support. And uh, the other thing is that the IMF loans are given not to the government of Sri Lanka, therefore, there is no relief yet. They are given to the central bank in order to come out of the, uh, foreign, uh, the balance of payments problem. So, therefore, uh, they hesitate in uh, contracting IMF as a, as a as a rescuing party for the current uh, economic problems Sri Lanka is facing. Then uh, government should uh, come up with a macroeconomic program if they borrow from the IMF. And uh, this is uh, not a very typical thing because uh, uh, every time when we go to IMF, the procedure is that the borrowing country will have to come up with a major macroeconomic adjustment program, which they have to announce to the IMF uh, board of directors uh, in the form of a letter of intent. And that letter of intent, remember, is signed not by the IMF people, it is signed by the borrowing country's Minister of Finance and the governor of the uh, central bank. And therefore, all these conditions which are actually imposed uh, following an IMF assistance are not the conditions imposed on us by the IMF. They are actually the conditions which we impose on ourselves because we think that, that those are the conditions which are necessary for us to have a good behavior. And uh, these conditions which the government would promise are, they would promise to free the markets and prices from all kinds of governmental controls. That means the present uh, regime of uh, exchange rate, uh, uh, fixing the exchange rate, uh, important exchange controls, price controls, interest controls will have to go away. Then uh, they will have to improve uh, the uh, ease of doing business uh, indicators in Sri Lanka which is a must if Sri Lanka wants to develop itself because the private sector's present problem is that uh, we are uh, actually classified at a very low level in the ease of doing business index. And as a result, uh, it is actually a nuisance for the private sector to invest and make some money or a nuisance for the foreigners to come and invest in Sri Lanka. So this will be one of the uh, requirements which the government will have to promise to IEM. Then uh, they have to promise that they are visiting the budget, which uh, Professor Kolumbage took us through very clearly. And uh, they have to raise revenue. They have to cut down the expenditure for unwanted things. They have to allocate uh, resources for essential productive purposes like health, education, uh, research and development, and so forth. And uh, as a result, there will be a, a disciplining in the budget. 
then the another important uh, condition which the government has to promise to IMF that government will go for a complete reform of the state-owned enterprises because presently the state-owned enterprises are actually functioning as a as a unit in the respective uh, ministry of the government, not as an independent business entity. And therefore, all the businesses are taken by the ministry and not by the state-owned enterprise. And as a result, these enterprises are making losses. And these losses have been recouped by the treasury from time to time by taking over the losses at the same at the expense of the taxpayers. And therefore, it has become a burden to the budget. So government will promise that government will reform the state-owned enterprises. Then the financial uh, legal structure will have to be improved, as uh, Professor Kolobage has mentioned. The central bank should be made an independent institution. The state sector banks will have to be freed from the Minister of Finance. And also, the private sector banks should not be uh, owned by the government. Now, presently, in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, we don't have any more private sector banks. All the leading private sector banks are owned by the Minister of Finance through various governmental agencies. And therefore, and we have to say very safely, we can say the Sri Lanka's finance banking sector is fully owned by the government, except the banks which are owned by the foreigners. Now, these things will have to be promised by the government in the, the letter of state. They have to come up with this macroeconomic uh, reform program. And if this program is acceptable to the IMF, then they will actually agree to provide funding to Sri Lanka. And uh, now, the Cabral solution is actually. It's one of the things that uh, the solution is that Sri Lanka will go for a homegrown uh, solution and not an IMF driven solution. Yeah, he has, I think, spoken the fact even if the IMF gives this solution, it's actually homegrown now because it is Governor Cup trial and Minister Basil Rajapaksa will have to sign the letter of intent and tell IMF that we have a program and not the IMF uh, which will give us the program. I think there's some misunderstanding in, in, in this particular aspect. I hope uh, Governor Kabdal will correct himself uh, uh, in the future. And the uh, homegrown program he had explained in, in one of the webinars uh, he had addressed recently, uh, where he said that we don't have to worry about this IMF funding because Sri Lanka is getting enough uh, high inflows into the foreign exchange market in the near future. And those high inflows are quite sufficient for Sri Lanka to meet its uh, all the uh, balance of payments problem. Uh, these inflows he had mentioned is that uh, we are getting some soft facilities from neighboring countries. Uh, we are getting uh, loan facilities from country to country, from another, again, from friendly countries. And we are depending on the remittances sent by the migrant workers from abroad. We are depending on the uh, flow of funds that is coming to the uh, Port City project and also the foreign direct investments that are to be contracted by Sri Lanka in the future. And most importantly, he has said uh, under the new uh, uh, Finance Act, uh, there has been a budget, uh, there has been a tax amnesty that has been announced by the government. So as a result, most of the people uh, who, have, uh, store, who have actually repatriated foreign exchange kept in outside the account uh, will, re will, re will return that foreign exchange to Sri Lanka so that they will earn this tax amnesty from the government and uh, to uh, stimulate them to uh, do it. Governor Kabdal in a tweet message uh, recently had said that if they pay their taxes in dollars, the government can consider giving them a, a D to free car permit also. So likewise, uh, they're expecting a very uh, a high amount of high inflows, which uh, the government thinks that uh, would make it uh, unnecessary uh, for it to go to IMF and get this borrowing facility. Then uh, Gavan Kapdal came up with another important thing. He said that the two ISDs which are to mature in 2022, one in January, uh, amounted to 500 US dollars, and the other one uh, maturing in July amounted to 1,000 US dollars. He's negotiating with the investment banks today to recycle these ISBs, that is, uh, total amount amounted to 1.5 billion US dollars uh, so that uh, they will buy them back when they are reissued at a discount. Now, this is a very important thing because the discount factor, I will have to explain further uh, later in my uh, presentation. Uh, there he had said uh, these things would be offered at a discount and therefore they will be recycled. And therefore there is no any immediate outflow of funds from Sri Lanka as a result of the uh, meeting the obligations on account of the 
maturing ISB SIM year 2022. Then uh, the, this discount may be at a very high level because the uh, main reason is that uh, this, uh, uh, these bonds are traded today at a huge uh, uh, discount in the market. Now, you can see immediately after Governor Kabdal made this announcement, the market didn't actually believe in that. What happened was the yield rates have, in fact, jumped up from the previous level uh, by about, say, in the case of the bonds, to mature in year 2022, the bond to mature in year January 22, they are not even traded in the market today. No one is willing to buy them, no one is willing to sell them because it's just a right of it. But the one to mature in, uh, in July, uh, the previous yield rate was 45%. Now it has jumped up to 57%. The previous market price of 74 US dollars per 100 rupee US dollar, US, uh, 100 dollar bond, it has come down to 10 to 50. And you can see in all other bonds across the board, the yield rates have increased by about two percentage points after Governor Kabdal made this announcement. That means the market is actually not accepting uh, this as a viable formula. What this means is if Sri Lanka wants to recycle the 1.5 billion bonds to mature in 2022, it may have to issue a bond with a maturity of 10 years. Now you can see uh, 10 year bonds are traded today at 1630 uh, yield rate and the price is 6250. And uh, if the government wants to encourage the existing investor to rebuy these bonds when they are newly issued, uh, probably they have to give a, a yield rate of about, say, 15% uh, uh, plus uh, a discount of about 30% there. That means uh, the government will have to offer a hundred dollar bond at 70, which means to raise 1.5 billion to repay in full uh, without causing an outflow for an exchange from Sri Lanka. The government will have to issue bonds to a value of say 2.5 billion US dollars next year. So that it will add to the uh, country's indebtedness further. And that is one of the things which Governor Kabdal said wants the present government to avoid because it doesn't want of Sri Lanka to incur additional foreign debt in the future. So this is one of the critical things that we are facing. And the um, IMF uh, loans are actually, uh, uh, SOFs are very costly now. He said that he's going to get these soft facilities and uh, many people do not understand the actual mechanism of the operation of the soft facility. Uh, when a soft is uh, negotiated with a foreign country, we agree to, because it is actually done at our request, not at the request of the other party to the soft. Therefore, they are in a position to dictate terms to us. So we agree to pay an interest of about, say, 200 uh, basis points, about 2%, over the uh, six-month LIBO rate prevailing. Now, present six-month LIBO rate is about, say, 0.05%. So we have to pay an annual interest of 2.05%. Uh, then there is an additional uh, cost uh, which Sri Lanka had to incur when these people would invest the rupee proceeds of the soft facility in Sri Lanka government treasury because uh, uh, since the, uh, they don't need rupees, we need dollars in the soft facility, we can use the dollars for our purposes, but the other part that is soft facility doesn't need rupees. So they are actually accumulated in an account either in the central bank or a commercial bank. And there is no reason for the other party to keep them in idle form in, the, in those accounts. So they will in invest those uh, uh, funds in Sri Lanka government treasury bills, earning about say 6% today. So what it means is a soft facility would cost us about say 8%, more than 8% if we go for that. But the danger is that unlike the facility from an IMF, where we would be repaying in, in, in biannual uh, installment, the soft facility has to be settled uh, as a single final payment, which you call a bullet payment, and uh, at the end of the period, which is a huge burden because, uh, now for example, the soft facility that we have to get from China, 1.5 billion US dollars, which has not been uh, so far used, the government says it will be uh, kept as a, as a backup uh, facility. And, uh, and, but if you have used them, uh, if you have, uh, we don't have dollars when the China, when China wants to reverse the uh, soft arrangement, then we have to either use our reserves or we have to uh, borrow money from outside to pay, repay China. And uh, this is a huge uh, 
debt uh, risk for Sri Lanka, which has to be taken into account. And the other thing is that soft hills are a temporary one, and uh, Professor Colombo had very clearly said that we have to go for long-term solutions rather than uh, temporary palliative. Then uh, Sri Lanka's choice is now very clear because uh, we have to go to IMF, uh, and IMF loans are uh, very uh, deep because uh, if you look at the uh, IMF loans, uh, those loans are uh, cheaper because uh, presently uh, Sri Lanka's uh, quota in the IMF is about 578 million uh, SDR. Uh, if we borrow, say, 2 billion SDR from IMF, which comes to about, say, 2.8 billion uh, US dollars, uh, we will have to pay an interest of uh, the, at the IMF interest rate, which is 0.05% plus 300%. So therefore, it will be 3.05% by of interest plus a service charge of half a percent. So the total IMF loan cost is 3.55% uh, compared to uh, eight more than 8% of the soft facility. In addition to that, there's a commitment fee where we have to pay uh, a refundable commitment fee at the beginning of every year at the rate of... Uh, uh, 60 basis points, which is refunded by IMF after we draw the balance. The other uh, advantage is Sri Lanka will, uh, in fact, uh, get uh, the facility for a period of, say, uh, four and a half to 10 years, uh, repayable in half yearly installment. Therefore, it's not a burden on the current inflows of the country, and it's not a burden for the repayment. And most importantly, the advantage is, as Professor uh, Kolobagi had very correctly said, we get the IMF certificate to go to international market. So in, that certificate is necessary if you want to exercise our credential and borrow money from international market. But as Professor Kolobage has said, these borrowing from the international market should not be simply for the for budgetary support. They should be linked to economic projects where the project will generate sufficient foreign exchange in order to enable Sri Lanka to repay. So I'll uh, in my presentation here, Professor Watavella, and I will participate in uh, uh, in whatever the uh, discussion that we'll be having. Thank you. Thank, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay Vajna. I think uh, you clearly explained as to the advantages of our going to IMF. Uh, I think uh, it was clearly explained even on the interest rates about the modes of payment and other areas, and which was earlier mentioned by Professor Kolambagi also. So maybe we will take a few questions uh, later, uh, Dr. Vijay Vodna. But now I would uh, in, uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Shiran Panandu, the Chief Economist of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, to speak on challenges and opportunities for the private sector. Shiran, over to you. Thanks, Professor Vatavala, and uh, it's been a pleasure and privileged to be part of this uh, forum and also uh, to speak after two uh, eminent speakers uh, who I follow and also uh, read constantly their updates and, and been on panels in particular uh, Dr. Vijay Vasana as well. Um, so uh, what, what are we trying to cover? I think we've got the flavor and context of um, the crisis and, and where things are at. Um, but what we're trying to kind of uh, uh, move forward to is, is at least in my coverage, is to uh, look at um, what are some of the solutions, in particular from the perspective of the private sector, because in economic crises and in debt crises, we've seen uh, in different countries, uh, be it in the Asian financial crisis in 97, 98, or even prior to that, uh, the role private sector plays uh, is an important part. Um, so the outline is initially maybe just to give a few of the macro challenges, which some of the uh, presenters alluded to as well, uh, but more related to the private sector, and then really look at a few um, solutions which we can look at, uh, while, of course, solutions like uh, going to the IMF and seeking other uh, SOP arrangements and other kind of assistance G2G probably could be looked at um, as well. So these are in solutions in addition to what uh, Dr. Vijay Vatana and, and Professor Kolambagi also uh, mentioned as well. Um, I think from the private sector point of view, I think we're still within a pandemic, but what we're clearly seeing uh, while we're seeing some of the growth numbers going up, we're also clearly seeing a rebound in um, economic activity, which is key. 
and one of the key indicators that is really good for um, for people to track is uh, the purchasing managers index, uh, which is an indicator you get uh, quite frequently. So, for example, in the month of September, you will get the August figure, uh, and and likewise uh, in in October you get the September figure. Unlike the GDP number, where you have to kind of wait till almost the next quarter to get the uh, to get the current quarter GDP number. Um, anything above 50, uh, which is the, the line here that's put in, is showing kind of expansion on a month-on-month -on -month basis. So what we see even during the three waves is how, uh, in the first wave particularly, how the private sector and all the economic services kind of collapsed. And uh, it took a while for it to come back uh, by about June and July. And we saw a similar phase during the second wave, but less so. And in third wave, we've kind of seen almost a, a V-shape in, in, in this kind of recovery with uh, the initial uh, lockdown during the third wave and the recent lockdowns in uh, the end of uh, the latter part of August as well. Uh, but all, overall, uh, clearly manufacturing is, is the one that is, uh, you know, powering growth, powering uh, the economic recovery, while services, because of the impact of tourism, is a bit more slower to recover. Um, the private sector is also uh, borrowing at this point. I think we're seeing uh, the low interest rates that were provided by the central bank. Uh, really coming into play and uh, the private sector has borrowed more this year in the these first seven months than they have in the whole of 2019 and 2020 and that's really supported by the low interest rate environment uh, some of this credit would be you know channeled through uh, some of the covid schemes that has been on offer uh, for refinancing as well as uh, for a lot of the businesses and sectors in particular sectors like tourism which were hit uh, uh, from 2019 onwards and, and 2020 and 21 but clearly uh, i think Prior to the pandemic, what we did see was uh, um, both fiscal easing. We saw tax rates, you know, cut, uh, VAT cut, um, corporate taxation obviously uh, pay done with, and then sort of brought back. And then we also saw monetary easing. So I think while Sri Lanka did not really see a lot of fiscal support um, compared to a lot of other countries, where there was a lot of, you know, money almost given to consumers, money given to um, to businesses, we just basically saw lower interest rates and, and these lower tax rates really uh, cushioning, uh, I would say, the private sector. And that has uh, helped to a certain extent drive uh, the recovery. And that is also seen uh, by this uh, chart as well. Um, what it has also meant, I think, with the recovery uh, in the global markets much faster than expected is the sharp rebound uh, that we've seen in exports. Um, so if you look at exports, I think uh, definitely much higher, about 20% much higher than last year. Still under what we were pre-pandemic 2019 and, and 2018. And of course, imports has been on the rise. And I think a multitude of factors, uh, both uh, some of those imports which are intermediate goods for exports, I think some of those have driven up some of our import bill. Uh, some of the other factors are obviously a larger fuel bill. Uh, and a lot of global commodities are up. Uh, a lot of the food indexes are up about 30, 40 percent. Uh, looking at the different uh, varieties, uh, so those are also adding uh, from a value perspective when we're importing, and that's causing also the pressure that we're seeing uh, on the currency in addition to the lack of dollar liquidity. Um, so I think this this uh, recovery kind of highlights also the resilience that we've seen within the private sector and some of the key sectors like apparel, rubber. Uh, T uh, doing uh, doing uh, quite well, and certain other sectors picking uh, up as well. In addition to services, um, what we've also seen, I think, uh, with the private sector, and I think this has been uh, part of the debt story, which probably is not getting too much of attention as well, is uh, the role that the local banks have been playing in the ISPs in the international credit fund. So towards the end of 2019, uh, if you looked at our outstanding stock, which was more than 15 billion. Close to about one billion uh, was held by uh, the local banks or uh, by the local banks or local residents. We, we can call that. Um, but uh, during the last year, we've seen that in uh, more on the short, uh, on the short and medium term bonds. So from about 1.1 billion, it has gone to close to about 2.2 uh, billion by the end of the first quarter of this year, which is where I the latest data. Uh, and so the private sector has played a role in, in terms of even easing some of the uh, ISP pressure on the, on the government. And I think that's the key part. So for example, 
in the 1 billion sovereign bond that came due in on the 27th of July, about 300 million of it was held by uh, the local bank. So it's not necessarily um, that it was, you know, an outflow of 1 billion, because about 200 to 300 million of that would have uh, come back. And it will be interesting to see, especially in the next uh, few uh, uh, ISBs, which are coming up, uh, uh, coming coming due, what, what kind of um, pressure or what, how much is held by the commercial banks. That is also, I think, had its own cash out of issues with a lot of the dollars kind of uh, being invested in these, and um, I think liquidity questions of some of the banks uh, would be uh, would be under pressure by kind of investing in these uh, instruments. But I think this is this has also been uh, a role that the private sector has played in this um, in this scenario. Uh, so what are the key challenges? I think the previous resident just highlighted, but if I look at it in terms of three areas. Um, just purely just putting a few numbers there uh, in terms of where we are on the current account balance. You know, this year we could maybe have a balance of about 2.5 billion or 3 billion next year. If things like tourism do claim come into play, we might still be looking at about uh, 1.9 billion. So in addition to managing this current account balance, you have to manage the foreign debt repayment. So in short, we kind of need to find almost that 6.5 to 7 billion uh, each year. Some of it might have a bit of a um, calculation, might have a bit of a recount because interest gets uh, ca captured in, in two areas as well. But overall, it's it's almost finding that six and a half to seven billion, which Professor Columba alluded to as well. And it's also about rebuilding uh, back reserves because uh, we've essentially been utilizing our reserves in the last 18 months to repay a lot of our commercial debt, in particular the ISP. And uh, with the downgrades, we have got locked out of the international capital markets and really relied on reserves to uh, repay. So, um, and this is this is uh, the pressure that's been added to um, uh, into the market in terms of uh, the inability to open LCs and things like that because obviously the central bank might not be able to support um, the liquidity as as much as they would have in, in previous years where there has been this level of uh, pressure. Uh, so it's about rebuilding back reserves and how, how can that uh, take place sustainably. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is the fiscal side of it. Uh, we've really seen, um, you know, successive governments in successive periods, at least over the last 30 years, how uh, revenue as percentage of GDP has slumped. Uh, we can see in other countries uh, who are at a similar growth rate or growing uh, revenue to per GDP, either 18% of GDP or 20% of GDP. Uh, but Sri Lanka is hovering around 11, 12. Last day, it, it, it came off uh, because of the impact of the pandemic and also the uh, tax cuts as well. And that has, of course, meant, um, despite what we've done on the expenditure side, really um, a lot of years when which, uh, in all these years, really being in a deficit and certain years uh, touching double digits or going even beyond it. So um, this is also an, an area which, uh, I think we've alluded to in terms of cutting public expenditure or, or trimming it or better rationalizing it, but really it might come down to how can we efficiently raise uh, more revenue without really impacting growth and, and maybe uh, the upcoming budget might spread a few things uh, uh, in, in that direction as well. Um, so in the medium term, while we sort of the fiscal side of it, of course, the issue is on the debt repayment side of it as well. Um, and how do we kind of meet these uh, load payments and sovereign bond payments and also keep up our Sri Lanka development bond uh, refinance as well. So um, some of the quick, uh, some of the, not the quick ones, but some of the solutions, and we'll get into it a little bit more is, of course, FDI really needs to come into play. Uh, but obviously with what's going on in the macro situation, there is a wait and see approach. So um, should, the quicker we get, our macro story a bit more better and organized. I think we will see an improvement in, in FDI. Um, we can also look at more multilateral and bilateral financing. I think that's an area which the government has been trying to explore, uh, trying to get the likes of World Bank and ADB to give much more than what they commit. I think on average each year, there is about 1.6 or 1.8 billion that comes from these, uh, that comes from these long-term loans uh, from these agencies. Can that go to, um, you know, about two, two and a half billion uh, tourism, of course, which we have not had anything in the last two years, and that being about at least one to two billion in, in 2022. Uh, and then on the goods and services side, can we incrementally in this period uh, increase by about one to two billion? And of course, sale of non-strategic assets, which I'll, I'll get to in a bit as well. 
but while the government borrows, I think there is also uh, a lot of opportunities in tapping uh, what we call development financial institutions. And if you look at um, from 2020, uh, just looking at three uh, three global uh, development financial institutions, IFC, if you look at the inter US International Development Financial Corporation and FMO, uh, which is a, which is a Dutch uh, DFI, um, we've seen over 500 million inflows coming in uh, to private sector, be it banks, be it uh, certain private enterprises, be it some conglomerates or finance companies. And a lot of those um, have been have been channeled in the last few years and different mandates, a lot of it is on the SME financing, but clearly there's a lot of these available uh, financing uh, instruments and, and um, financing interests. Uh, and, and low cost financing that's available for the private sector then in turn to kind of channel it to the economy while improving uh, the inflow level as well. We're also seeing other trade and supply chain programs uh, from multilaterals like ADP, who while they're lending to the government is also looking to increase what we call the non-sovereign portfolio, which is kind of the involvement with the private sector and on, on, trade, on trade aspects as well. Uh, so that was around uh, 358 million last year, for example. Uh, can can the private sector maybe um, engage with these uh, multilateral agencies a bit more and see whether some of their trade can be financed, so that eases the pressure on on the government as well. And something a bit more emerging, and I think a lot more research needs to be done on this. But um, there's a lot of financing available, especially related to SDGs and green development related uh, green development financing. And one example is uh, debt for climate swap, uh, which is, has been practiced by certain countries uh, like Seychelles and a few other countries uh, where uh, maybe in return for some of the private debt held by international creditors, because our ISV is not held by one, in, one, one institution, it's held by a lot of institutions. Can some of these, uh, you know, can a, can a government or another development agency come in and, and buy these in terms in exchange for certain um, um, uh, promises or commitments towards on on the climate side, which Sri Lanka is has to has to invest in eventually and and has to given a lot of the risk. Uh, so there are there are these kind of innovative development financial instruments which are popping up, which potentially uh, both which will require both the government and the private sector to get involved in as well. Um, the next set of slides is just to talk about a bit on the export side, which is the key aspect. How do we get to that? You know, one to two billion more incrementally over the next few years. Um, why I'm trying to show you this timeline uh, is uh, just to highlight how countries that were faced with the Asian financial crisis, um, you know, really recovered and has has built resilience, built up the reserves simply by increasing the export portfolio. So we can see how Vietnam, for example. Has, has significantly increased their textile exports while increasing um, electronics. Thailand, for example, which is in fact has significantly, uh, obviously tourism is a big part of the economy that has grown, but agriculture, machinery. So they've really got into these uh, kind of uh, exports as well. Uh, Singapore, which is another country uh, that has also, um, they were not too bad. As they were, I mean, they were kind of impacted by the crisis, but they've also seen a lot of their exports uh, picking up and doing much better. And a lot of these countries are five to six times much exporting much more uh, than the, what they were in the early 90s as well. Malaysia, now this is a country which stayed away from going to the IMF. Um, they employed what you call in Sri Lanka's term homegrown policies, uh, did a lot of unconventional things, uh, took, took a lot of hard reforms um, as well. And a lot of their success also has been to uh, improving the export portfolio uh, post that post the recovery and of course um, they do have uh, palm oil and a few other natural resources to count on but clearly uh, they've also gone in that direction and that brings me to Sri Lanka in terms of where we are in this scenario I think we we still really relied on on textiles and a few agricultural exports like tea uh, services has really taken off I think in the last uh, 10 years but beyond that there hasn't been um, what the other speakers were talking about in terms of those global value chain uh, related products and, and machinery and, and exports in, in that aspect. And of course, the complexity because the world is evolving, the world is demanding greater products, uh, more complex products, and, and we are still on the very uh, low end of 
uh, the complexity and that that kind of highlights how much more we can uh, value add and uh, export as well and get more value uh, for the volume we are exporting uh, from exports i think the other aspect is uh, fdi of course that's another area which will support this recovery and the private sector can help there are a lot of com companies uh, which are boi companies uh, which continue to reinvest can they really look at this uh, time to kind of reinvest even more. And I think that's kind of uh, what the BOI and, and some of the, their expectation is as well. And could they be ambassadors uh, to bring in more FDI um, in the next few years as the macro uh, situation clears up? And this is kind of a, um, a illustration that I took from one of our recent reports, which is on the Sri Lanka economic acceleration framework, which we published in 2019 and 2020. Um, which looks at a lot of sectors, but on infrastructure, I think there is a lot of opportunity for private funding uh, or PPPs in, in a lot of these sectors and really remove that burden out of government in terms of spending for a lot of these infrastructure, but utilize the private sector, utilize a lot of instruments uh, that are there uh, to get some of these key projects, key uh, sectors uh, developed. So I think that's another area, interesting area. Uh, to really look at uh, because we need to we need to look at all the facets in terms of you know how, when you get your budget deficit down obviously capex will fall but capex does not necessarily have to fall if investment kind of gets funneled through all these areas and and the last area i think is on the divestment of underutilized assets i think this is something the governor has also alluded to as well um, of course the three um, hotels as well as uh, you know raising some of these capital through uh, the stock exchange our uh, estimates you know maybe put it potentially around 300 million if there's a divestment of maybe 49% in these hotel properties. And something which each subsequent budget has been talking about, which is listing or raising 10% capital uh, from some of the state banks, that could potentially bring about 200 million. So here again lies another 500 million that uh, we can potentially use to uh, plug this uh, gap as well. Um, so in short, I think the next Several months definitely will be challenging for the private sector and the economy and, and the general public. Um, there is a lot of opportunity for the private sector, be it on the debt side, be it on the equity side, to really facilitate more in inflows as well. Um, but clearly, in the medium term, exports of goods and services really will be the key, and that has been shown uh, by a lot of countries, in particular during the Asian financial crisis. Uh, so let me end, end here, Professor Watwala, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Shiran. I think uh, you gave the uh, real uh, role that has to be played by the private sector, I think, in most of the areas that we have given. Uh, but I feel that uh, private sector has a very, very major role to play, you know, and uh, uh, what you have given, if you can get uh, them also involved in it. Because one of the areas I can really say is the, you are talking about the garment sector and how the 200 garment factories really succeeded because of the private sector, you know, but then the government gave all the incentives and uh, maybe broke through all the barriers and got it done. So that's uh, one thing, and I'm sure that uh, you will be there to guide them. So uh, with those comments, can I get uh, Manil, uh, can you uh, give your expert comments on uh, uh, these speakers? Because I'm sure you will have a lot to say because it's also relating to a uh, lot of the accounting and auditing uh, provisions that are involved. Uh, thank you, Professor. <laughs> Actually, uh, no, I think all the speakers have uh, sort of articulated uh, the problem we are in. And uh, I think Shiran has alluded in some extent to some of the solutions uh, uh, or the areas where we can really uh, address of course some of these are medium term solutions some of them are long and uh, then, then there is the short term part of it as well uh, as, as uh, i think uh, some of the speakers mentioned uh, the the real issue is uh, i think due to the i think this issue has to be broken into two aspects one is the issue there was an issue that was already there before the pandemic pandemic just aggravated this whole cash flow uh, issue in my view uh, so the issue that was already there is one solution and the pandemic has also created, uh, it has aggravated the problem. So because we have lost about, I think, $5 billion uh, of inflows in 2020 because of tourism, maybe $3.6 to $4 billion, uh, 
plus then the exports suffered by about a billion. Uh, so we lost about foreign inflows of about 5 billion or somewhere about that. Now, the issue there is uh, in the next cash flows or next inflows that are coming in, will this loss be caught up or not? So if you are going to catch up, then the funding or the, the solutions that you like to go for will be a short-term plan. If, if you are not going to catch up these inflows, then obviously uh, that has to get spread over a period of time where the inflows are going to get caught up. So that, that's, to, that's to go back to where we were. Uh, the other issue would be, uh, the question is, where we were, were we having a problem? So if, if that is the case, then there is obviously certain things that has to be done. I think as Shiran mentioned, uh, I've been hearing this story about, you know, we have to diversify our uh, uh, exports or the areas that we are exporting, but it has never happened for the last so many years. We have been talking about it. Uh, I know in 2015, people are talking about Vietnam's example. Uh, saying that Vietnam had such a big portfolio of uh, uh, inflows, whereas we had only a few few items, but uh, they don't seem to be looking at this. Uh, when it comes to SOEs and uh, structuring of SOEs, that's another area I think uh, we have to seriously look at. Uh, we have to look at how we are going to increase the FDIs, because I think in the last few years, our FDIs have dropped to about a billion or even less than that. So, so these are the areas uh, I think we have to look at it. So uh, though uh, Dr. Vijayawadana illustrated the benefits of uh, really going in for the IMF uh, type of thing, but uh, also you have to be careful with the IMF is that you will become complacent. So if this is a short-term cash flow problem, you're going for long-term repayment, means you become complacent in the, uh, the, the matching of the cash flows. True, it's cheaper source, but you become complacent. So the Actually, the million-dollar question is, can we catch up these cash flows, the inflows at least? In, once the country is opened and the tourism starts coming in, will there be a catch-up or will we just go back to our original uh, inflows, which is the, the three and a half or four billion uh, dollars? Uh, of course, this whole problem has got uh, sort of escalated purely because, okay, we lost the inflows, but at the same time, we had to make, make good our debt repayment. So that, that, that mismatch is, I think, where we are. Uh, the foreign currency problem is also because of that. And um, so, so I, I don't really have a solution to this, uh, but I think we have to look at it. But uh, what you said is absolutely true. I think yesterday, uh, the President of IFAC also uh, mentioned, you know, I think we need to get into better financial management. Uh, all these are really uh, symptoms of the fact that we, we don't seem to be managing our finances properly. We are on a very temporary uh, cycle. And some of the, I think, the macroeconomic stuff that we are saying is, to some extent, our political scenario is also uh, contributing to this. We have a five-year election period. You know, during now, someone mentioned uh, saying that we are now doing things to facilitate an election next year. So this, this is the scenario in this country, unfortunately. Every five years, we have a reset. And then... Uh, so this macroeconomic stability and whatever it is, I'm of course not too sure how we are going to bring this about because of this uh, political five-year reset that we keep coming. Even if the same party comes in, you still have a reset because you have to go to elections in five years. So then all these good things that people do sometimes uh, goes out of the window. So I, I don't know, Professor, the, the answer, yeah, I don't yeah. know. But clearly uh, what you say is right. I think there has to be professionalizing of this, uh, professionalizing of the uh, state sector and the man management of the finance of the country. Actually, there is one uh, uh, question also someone has raised about these SOEs. Uh, they said that uh, uh, the restructuring of the SOE during the last regime and qualified accountants were appointed to suggest solutions. However, was not transparent. So we don't know what happened to those suggestions, right? Uh, then also the, they're asking the question that what solution is best to restructure to avoid huge losses by the state, state sector utilities and stop subsidies from the from treasury continuing. So this again is a social problem. So it's, it's a country's a social problem. So like now Shilon Lexery Board, uh, if you look at it, uh, 90, uh, I think there's about 60 odd percent of the consumption is less than 90 units. Now, that less than 90 units is heavily subsidized. 
Now, now the problem is uh, you remove that subsidy, which means either the wealth of the people or the capacity of the people also have to increase to pay for this. So, so some of these things, uh, I do not. We seem to know the problem, but I don't think we know the solution. So, okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Manil, I think, for those comments. Uh, actually, just I just want to make one comment on what you mentioned about the subsidies. Now, this is a thing that we need to correct. You know, if uh, Ceylon Electricity Board is selling things at a lower price as a result of a government decision, then that amount should be shown as a subsidy. Because at the moment, it is really uh, showing the incorrect picture, which I has to be corrected. Uh, so I think if they show everything, all uh, prices determined by the government uh, should, if it is below, they have to do a proper uh, costing and the account should be correct. The difference should be shown as a subsidy of the government, which they will have to give from the budget allocation. Then I think discipline will come in. So I'm just suggesting that, but I would like maybe Dr. Vijayavadna's comments on what Manil said and also about this uh, subsidy element. Well, um... This subsidy element in the uh, Ceylon Electricity Board and all other public uh, corporations, uh, whatever, is cross subsidized. What you do is what the government does is government gets money from one pocket and pays another guy in, into another pocket. Now, in economics, uh, there's a golden rule saying that these cross subsidizations won't work because uh, people who have to pay have no intention of paying and people who receive have no intention of uh, economically using. So as a result, uh, there is this uh, problem called the moral hazard problem arises because uh, there is no incentive for you to uh, use the subsidy most productively for the system. So it will start, you know, breeding. It it start multiply like the uh, the fertilizer subsidy given by the government, then uh, subsidy given to uh, the Sri Lankan Transport Board, subsidy given to the Sri Lanka Railways. Uh, they have been justified on the ground that you know those institutions are doing you know great service to uh, their the members of the public. But what happens is uh, when the subsidy is built into the cost structure of these organizations. They have no incentive to get out of it and they, they enjoy it. So therefore, you have to give more subsidies in order to keep them going. So this is the problem with subsidies. Professor. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here. Don't you think uh, development of the port city will greatly help to revive the economy? Well, um, I think Professor Colombian also will answer this. I have been telling this, you know, port city is a kind of appendix. You know, it's not a part of Sri Lanka. It's not a part of the Sri Lankan economy. I will give an example because I went to Cambodia in year 2008. And there was a ship, casino ship, which had been brought to Cambodian waters. And it had been anchored in the waters. And we had to go in a boat to the ship. We played casinos. And the casino fellow earned the money and he paid the rent to the Cambodian government for that purpose and he just vanished. This poor city is all like that. You know, it's, the, it's like a ship that had been brought to Sri Lankan waters and anchored there. And we'll be getting the rent for allowing that ship to be anchored in Sri Lankan waters. And because uh, many people think even the governor Kapdal had, you know, said it uh, he very publicly had said that, you know, one of the... Uh, flows that he is expecting in the future is the flows that are coming to uh, the port city. Remember, the port city is not doing business in Sri Lanka rupees. Port city is doing business in foreign currencies, US dollars, and uh, very soon they will allow even yuan to be uh, one of the currencies to be traded there. And uh, accounts will be opened by the people who will set up businesses there in US dollars and not in Sri Lanka rupees. That is number one. Number two, they will not open accounts with Bank of Ceylon or any other bank. They will open accounts with banks outside Sri Lanka. So as a result, the money doesn't come to Governor Kapdal's balance of payments. He thinks that the money comes to balance of payments. It doesn't come. And uh, because now there's a question posed by Mr. Upul Viraratna. He says, uh, presently the expatriate workers in Sri Lanka, when they want to remit their salaries abroad, they have not been permitted to do it in one go. It has been split into two. 
they are my they 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 will be first created to a rupee account 50 percent has been uh, permitted to be set out the balance 50 percent once the foreign exchange is available now professor whatever given the situation which the foreign investor who is coming to a uh, uh, fourth city project in Sri Lanka will open an account with the bank in Sri Lanka. He must be an extremely stupid fellow because uh, if the foreign exchange is not available with the bank and uh, the bank will say, okay, I will, I will release your foreign exchange, maybe 20% today, another 20% tomorrow uh, in, in, in various, you know, installments because the port city is like a, uh, like an additional economic thing because you can compare it to uh, when uh, Hong Kong was uh, a part of the British colony and it was a, it was actually Hong Kong was owned by the uh, Chinese government but you know it developed itself without uh, uh, providing any facility for the uh, the Chinese economy only facility was when China was opened up in 1978 uh, Hong Kong became the main trading partner for the Chinese businesses. So likewise, if Port City in Colombo will become the main trading partner for all the uh, uh, businesses that have been conducted within the uh, Sri Lankan economy proper, uh, we may be able to get an additional service in the form of an uh, advantage for Sri Lanka's economy. Other than that, uh, Port City will not solve our uh, foreign exchange problems, Professor Arthur. Yeah, so, uh, what is the advantage you think that the port city will give to Sri Lanka? Because now they are also I mean, they are, talking over, they are talking over banking, banking hub. No, that will be uh, now in the within the port city. They'll set up uh, say banking hub where all foreign banks and all will come. They so will come. That, uh, yeah, we, we they will, will not, come. not they will be come. under the central bank. Is it? No, it no, no they are not under the central bank. That's the problem. They will be there. They will open their accounts with their foreign uh, correspondent parts. They will receive money. They will lend money. And uh, they make money, and at the end of the day, they pay rent to Sri Lanka for uh, renting that land. That's all. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, uh, Professor Kolomagi. You have to unmute, please. Unmute. Yeah, yeah I fully agree with uh, Dr. Vijayvardhana. In fact, both of us worked in the balance of payments division for a long time, <laughs> way back in the uh, 1980s and 1990s. So, both of us know how what is going on. In fact, uh, I, I, you know, I'm always confused about this, how the port city is going to contribute to our economy. I think Dr. Vijayvadana gave a very beautiful picture, not a very beautiful picture, but a gloomy picture rather, you know. So I totally agree with him. I, I am confused. In fact, I am not uh, clear how the port city is going to, port city's transactions are going to be integrated with the mainland, you know, Sri Lanka's uh, balance of payments. That is that is a major uh, worry. That is a major concern that I have all these days. But everybody says that uh, Port City is going to contribute. But as uh, Dr. Vijayvadan rightly mentioned, that uh, money will come and go and uh, the uh, balance of payments will remain uh, intact. So that is uh, one problem. And also with the current uh, situation, you know, we are going through a new normal situation. So the old uh, concepts of uh, buildings, uh, infrastructure might not be necessary in, the, in years to come. So uh, we, the, I mean, you can do ba banking transactions from your home without uh, having a, having to have a big uh, offices and so on and so forth. So that is uh, another disadvantage. And this uh, integration of the uh, port city with the national economy is a rather gray area. And that has that is not very clear. And also, I would like to say a few words about the uh, what you talked about the you know costing subsidy. I think uh, Dr. Yeah. and Professor Watto rightly uh, mentioned that uh, this led these things led to lead to a moral hazard. And similarly, on the government revenue side, also there are moral hazards. Recently, the government, uh, the parliament approved uh, the tax amnesty bill. Of course, uh, from time to time, many con several countries have adopted this. In, even in Sri Lanka, we have had uh, so many tax amnesty bills. But the thing is, uh, these kinds of you know tax amnesties might lead to moral hazards. In the, if you are paying, if you are not paying taxes, why should I pay? You know that kind of. Uh, so I think the bigger, bigger players or bigger racketeers might escape, whereas the honester 
taxpayers are penalized. So that is one disadvantage. So these things have been looked again. I think I would emphasize that uh, management accountants have major role to play. And so you, you have a big job in the future. So that is one area I think we should uh, look at. Perhaps yeah. the government, the, the C CMA should, uh, uh, or CMA can, you know, integrate with government uh, planners, policy makers, and have more transparent. And it applies to the central bank as well, because the top managers, I won't name anyone, but uh, they just come and sit there and they can just vanish. You know? I'm not talking about Dr. Vijay Vandana, you know. <laughs> But uh, you know, outsiders may come and go. You know, so nobody is accountable, unlike in a private company. So all these public institutions should be accountable and transparent. Thank that you, is uh, the very purpose of the central bank drafted drafted yeah. three three years ago. So I will stop there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Professor Kolumbia. I think accountability. Uh, we have no time to discuss. But uh, Shiran, can you comment on the port city? Because I am sure from the private sector, you all are looking at this in a big way. Sure. But I slightly disagree that they don't have an value add or advantage. I think the finer details, probably how it will integrate, might come through the regulations, uh, which are pending post the uh, uh, overall act being passed. Uh, but there are two th two things. I think there is obviously the, the the hard infrastructure, which is the building, the marina, all of that infrastructure that will come into play. And secondary will be the uh, secondary demand, which is. Uh, the services to come in uh, to these uh, to these buildings, as we call it, um, or to these service to these plug and play service uh, areas, and I think that's kind of the the real opportunity to see. For example, I think we got um, uh, STL, which is one of the big uh, IT firms operating out of India, and within a year they've created a thousand jobs, or, or at least thousand jobs have been uh, utilized. So, can we really attract more of these uh, kind of big uh, big uh, IT firms and other services firms to really come in and, and position themselves in, in areas like the port, like the port city and that will organically grow and this is a more long-term project. So in the near term, it might not necessarily solve our problems because a lot of those inflows will be associated with imports for machinery, building and things like that and sand and all of that which will uh, be used for the hard infrastructure. But I think the software infrastructure and early signals of what the software infrastructure is bringing the likes of STL and others, I think that will be the key key element and that will be the sounding board. And I think uh, we've historically, and, and uh, we've, we've lacked a anchor project to kind of showcase Sri Lanka as an FTI destination. And I think Port City offers that where people might open eyes because a lot, to a lot of countries, Sri Lanka is not really known and, and we don't have a real USB. So potentially, Port City be, could be a, a USB to showcase Sri Lanka and then from then on showcase the other sectors and aspects of it. So I think I think therein lies. I think it's, we have to go we have to go be, a bit beyond the details. Thank you, Shiran. I think uh, our time is coming to a close, but uh, two minutes I give Dr. Vijay Vandana to give his closing remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Vattavala, and uh, we'll have to recognize the fact that Sri Lanka is at a very critical situation today. It is not a problem of Gotabe Rajapaks or Governor uh, Ajitwat Kabral. It's a problem of all of us. And therefore, whether we have IMF or not, we have to be ready for the strictest austerity measures that are to come to us in the next, next you know, year or so. If you are having, you know, one... Uh, uh, three meals, so we may have to settle for two meals. And this was very beautifully presented by Finance Minister Basil Rajapaksa that, you know, we are like, you know, Marna Turak Atiminye Penikaya because we are, have three types of, you know, death threats, but still we are licking some honey. Now, this licking honey will have to be stopped. In fact, I think he gave us a warning also the type of you know the uh, the economic austerity policy measures that that we follow, uh, we have no choice about it today whether we go for IMF or not, and uh, that is the uh, compulsory restriction that we have to impose on ourselves. Uh, also, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay Vandana. Uh, Manil Jaising, our co-chairman. Manil, uh, uh, you can give your closing remarks and thank our uh, speakers and panelists. 
you have to unmute mic thank you uh, professor and i think uh, uh, everyone would agree that uh, our three eminent uh, uh, speakers have brought in three different dimensions of this whole problem and uh, all of us in this country today are uh, concerned about what's going to happen in the next uh, day or two or month or whatever it is and uh, i think uh, dr vijaywardhan very uh, clearly articulated that uh, we all have to embrace ourselves to go through some uh, pain before we can see the gain which will come later i guess uh, so uh, i think with that let me also uh, thank uh, all the, the paper the presenters uh, for their uh, views and uh, candid views and uh, analysis of our problem uh, so uh, we i think as a society and a nation we'll have to work together to try and get us out of this whole equation uh, in this whole equation i think the accounting profession also has a key to, key to play uh, in helping uh, the government and and the society at large to sort it out and uh, also uh, to thank uh, professor whatever to for hosting uh, moderating this session which i hope the audience has uh, benefited a lot on this uh, and uh, we can only hope that we, we can all work together and try try to pull us out of this uh, deep hole that we have dug ourselves into uh, of course the pandemic has not helped so we don't know when the next wave will come and uh, or for that matter which might not be the pandemic it might be another black swan type of event but i think uh, the writing is somewhat clear uh, i think the these eminent uh, presenters very clearly mentioned uh, the writing is clear so we'll have to as a country i guess work together and uh, see how we can get out of this uh, hole so thank you prof thank you thank you thank you very much uh, mr manil jay singh i think uh, for your closing remarks and all the support that you have given uh, so let me once again i think he's already thanked but let me uh, uh thank our eminent speakers professor sirimohan kolamage dr vijayvardhana mr shiran fernando and now of course our co chairman manil and uh, i think it was a very very great presentation and i'm sure uh, there are a few questions but uh, due to time limitations uh, unfortunately we can uh, we are unable to do that we have to go into another session so let me once again thank all of you all and uh, we will now uh, close our session and hand over to the next one thank you very much uh, all of you thank you thank you uh, good afternoon to all of you thank you very much i think we've just finished our session so i will now invite uh, those in the technical session 2 uh, building a trade surplus with a strong export economy i think the chairman is there uh mr nandika buddipala then uh, the co chairman mr tanwaratna uh, mr suresh dimel building a strong export economy it industry a major growth sector for export economy sorry 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 let me see that right yeah, okay yeah mr ushad asenanayak then of course global trends in export economy uh, lessons for sri lanka it's correct no uh, okay fine fine uh, miss subhashini abey singh i hope all of you all are there suba i don't know with the mr i think nandika you are there yeah 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 let me see whether the others are there with the professor i am here but my camera is a problem uh, i am here i'm trying to fix oh, the camera there, right uh, mr surik ah ushad i also there i fine so let me see Uh, uh, let me check again and see uh, so uh, uh, i uh, mr karnaratna i think uh, you have to introduce the chairman and after that chairman will take over i think can you do that please yeah professor i can do it but only my problem is with my camera so shall i yeah, yeah. that's this? okay that's okay you okay. read here okay okay uh, thank you uh, professor watavela uh, as uh, mentioned by the professor uh, this is the second session for the day uh, building a trade surplus with a strong export economy uh, the chairman of the session is mr nandika buddipala uh, who is the president national chamber of commerce of sri lanka and chief financial officer 
Commercial Bank of Ceylon. He counts over 30 years experience in banking, telecommunication, and audit and assurance industries. He's a fellow member of CA Sri Lanka, Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, UK, and CMA Sri Lanka. He holds a bachelor's degree in business administration, postgraduate diploma in management, master's in business administration, financial economics and financial mathematics. He holds many positions. He serves as the chairman of the member network panel, ACC Sri Lanka branch, president of the National Advisory Committee of Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment Sri Lanka branch, member of the ACSA, ACCA Global Forum for Education, member of the CMA Cost and Management Accounting Standards Board, member of the National Institute of Business Management Governing Council, external faculty member of the Faculty of Management Studies and Commerce of the University of Sri Javadinapura. So with that, let me uh, invite Mr. Nandika Buddhipala to take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anurana. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I just uh, maybe will give very, very brief uh, outlook uh, or very brief uh, description of what we have to discuss. It's uh, quite, uh, quite obvious that uh, trade balance is always kind of a very important element of the economy, balance of payment and the GDP. Uh, up to July, we know that our trade balance reported a deficit of uh, 4.9 billion US dollars, whereas the last year it was only 3.4 billion during this period of time. Uh, the encouraging factor is that uh, growth in exports uh, ran up to the level of about 23.7% uh, during the period compared to the last year, but imports unfortunately staggered uh, into the level of 30 per, more than 30% kind of a growth. Uh, now, Sri Lanka, according to the various measurements, uh, such as population size, per capita GDP, and comparative trade the openness, uh, normally the people used to call it uh, as an open, uh, small open economy. But unfortunately, some of the theorists and the economists argue uh, when we say open, because uh, the, the, the value proposition or the uh, argument comes whether we are open as far as uh, the, some of the policies are concerned. Uh, now, but unfortunately, our exports as a percentage of GDP has been uh, quite low. Uh, it's, it's very well understood that exports is going to be very, very eminent feature or very eminent component as far as the small economies are concerned. Now, I think yesterday, the professor here, you uh, Kay, just, just mentioned the fact that uh, how uh, the, the uh, Singapore has been growing. But uh, one thing that we need to keep in mind is that uh, uh, the, when we look at trade uh, in Singapore as a percentage, GDP is running to more than 300 or 350 percent. Then when we look at the exports, even the, the exports uh, under normal circumstances, forget about the uh, COVID, it's running into more than 170 percent of their GDP. So uh, when you are a small economy, naturally you need to have the trade. And there's no argument about it, even though certain uh, mishaps or certain uh, uh, temporary things what we do uh, in the in the face of COVID is not going to resolve the problem. Uh, quite interestingly, uh, the recent annual conference of International Economic Association, uh, which is maybe about six years old, uh, last uh, July, I think uh, we had it, uh, Professor Penny Goldberg, uh, the Professor of Economics at Yale University, and she was the uh, second member, uh, Chief Economist at uh, the World Bank uh, during the period of 2018 to 2020. What she said is that if you really want to have close economy, then your size should be minimum 300 million population. Otherwise, you are not going to be a developed country. So I stop at that point, and I'll just quickly introduce uh, my uh, the panelist. First of all, I need to introduce uh, Mr. Kanuratna. Uh, uh, he is my co-chairman, and uh, it's a great pleasure to have Mr. Kanuratna with me. Uh, like uh, he's. Uh, he has uh, the Master of Commerce degree uh, in finance from the University of New South Wales, Australia, and postgraduate diploma in applied strategy, statistics, uh, Bachelor of Science, physical science degree from University of Colombo. Uh, he's fellow member of Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, uh, CMA, CMA UK, and associate member of the Certified Management Accountants, CMA of Sri Lanka. Uh, we know that he's the uh, he's an assistant governor, but on the top of it, 
uh, he, he is the uh, secretary to the monetary board as we speak. Congratulations for that as well. And that uh, uh, the, the exposure is going to add a huge amount of value to the discussion today. Next, uh, very quickly, I move into the uh, uh, next speaker, Mr. Suresh Dimal. Uh, there's no need for me to have a long introduction. Everybody knows him. When we look at the EDB, uh, it has been uh, doing great amount of work. We know uh, at Chambers how uh, uh, proactive, uh, what kind of support that uh, the, the EDB has been extending to. Uh, maybe very brief introduction to uh, Mr. Suresh Dimel. He holds a Bachelor of uh, Science degree in Agriculture Engineering from uh, California Polytechnic State University. And uh, he works maybe over a 10 years period uh, in the area of agriculture and environmental engineering in the USA. Uh, then he's the chairman of and the CEO of uh, Sport Fishing, uh, the uh, Lanka, where uh, he works with 300 smallholders uh, uh, in spice herb, uh, farmers in specifically in the Monragala, Badulla, Candy, Martale, and Ampara district promoting sustainable uh, organic uh, agri uh, related area. Uh, so I quickly move into the other area the, the, uh, Mr. Osha, the, uh, Osha, the Sena Naika comes in. Naturally, the uh, factor productivity is going to be a very key element when it comes to uh, the adding value into the exports. And we need to have uh, that, that particular uh, the RPA and uh, the so many other elements coming from this area. Uh, this is IT industry and uh, he's uh, the chairman of BICTA, uh, the most uh, eminent person to talk about uh, the, this, this particular area of uh, economy. Uh, uh, Sudhira Naika is the chairman of BICTA and also director general of the uh, TRC, Telecommission Regulatory Commission. Then also the previously uh, headed uh, multiple startup ventures uh, in throughout the world, and uh, he engaged uh, in majority of blue chips in country in driving forward uh, its uh, digital strategies, uh, the specifically the conversion of that in the banking area as well. He uh, he worked for uh, Fortune 100 clients in the IT front and USA and Europe as well. Uh, Digital transformation strategies is predominantly in the banking finance sector uh, in Sri Lanka as well. He holds MBA from AIB Australia and a bachelor from the bachelor's from the University of uh, Northumbria, Newcastle. Uh, and uh, he has been a business lecturer of uh, Bedfordshire, Oxford the School of Business uh, for postgraduate MBA students as well. Very brief uh, introduction to you, uh, Oshada. Uh, in the interest of time, I, otherwise I will have a lot of uh, things to talk about you and uh, Suresh. Uh, then moving into uh, our last speaker who needs um, no more kind of introduction because he appears in so many places and everybody knows her, uh, the Swashini Abe uh, the research director at uh, Verite. We, we know what, uh, what Verite is. Uh, she's an expert uh, on uh, Sri Lanka economy, private sector development, trade policy, WTO, regional trade agreements, ports and logistics in that particular area. Uh, she has bachelor's degree in economics, uh, first class honors, and master's degree in economics uh, from the University of Colombo. Uh, uh, and uh, she has master's degree in international law and economics uh, from World Trade Institute, University of Bern, uh, Switzerland. And uh, she works uh, worked for uh, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce for 10 years uh, as their senior economist. And uh, she's, uh, she worked as a visiting lecturer the Faculty of Graduate Studies, uh, University of uh, Colombo, and uh, Sir uh, John Patalavla Defense University as well. So very briefly, that's the, the description. And uh, we immediately we get into the subject uh, since it's running into uh, nearly four o'clock now. And I would like to invite uh, Mr. Suresh Dimel uh, to talk about building a strong export economy, which is not an easy task, we know that. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Dimil, for your presentation. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Uh, so, yes, yeah. thank you. Good. Um, I will talk about the opportunities of the new normal when it comes to exports. Um, we have depended on apparel, tea, rubber, and coconut for a long time. And it continues to 
support apparel continues to support 50% of our uh, merchandise exports and tea rubber and coconut uh, also uh, contribute uh, quite a bit in that in our exports however as i heard previous speakers say diversification in, in into products various products and markets is very important and has been for a long time in the new normal we have some great opportunities that augur well for sri lanka one is value added agriculture i think that is uh, a no brainer as sri lanka is an agricultural uh, we have a lot of opportunity in that area so um, you know uh, people ask me all the time about low hanging fruit uh, to exploit and i always say it's in fruits and vegetables because 50% or more of the fruits and vegetables that are already harvested go to waste in this country and has been and we have uh, i know for when i was in university doing agricultural engineering my father told me to study post harvest technology because it was a, an issue then and i did and and still uh, sri lanka lacks that capacity currently i am in i process organic spices for export but i still see a lot more opportunity for uh, value addition now um when it comes to uh, food food value addition there is a whole host of uh, support that we in the government need to introduce uh, part of it is the certification the laboratory facilities now those are the things that seem to be stunting post harvest uh, value addition and uh, we at the edb have identified a lot of uh, areas where we need some investment and maybe public private investment to uh, to do this now uh, packaging that's a, another very important thing and branding and and uh, moving up in the value chain now um, this is something that we always uh, sometimes miss the point that we we spend a lot of money on talking about the world's best tea and the world's best cinnamon the world's best black pepper and so on however when you look at the markets where we are selling this product is not a premium market now uh, you know tea we still have a lot more opportunity to add value to our tea when you look at that world market of tea uh secondly cinnamon we sell most of it to another third world country in mexico our black pepper we sell most of it to india and we need to understand this and figure out how we are going to change this now the most important thing in food uh, exports or any any anything as far as that's concerned is quality volume and price these are the three issues that our exporters seem to be missing that's they don't think that way you know we have to understand that we cannot export everything to everybody that's i have noticed that many especially smes who want aspire to go to uh, foreign markets do not uh, understand the importance of a segment of the market i explain this in a in like the automotive industry where we have from marutis to lamborghinis and and all the segments in between now if we have a world's best product we should aim at the top we should aim to be a lamborghini however it seems that our exporters aim to the commodity markets where it's easy 
And that's partly because I think we have a trading mentality. We quickly sell it to a quick buyer and we make a quick buck. That's, meant, that's the trading mentality, I think. I think if we had more entrepreneurial investor mentality, we would be adding value and shooting for the premium markets. Where, you know, I believe that premium markets now, I, I have been exporting in premium markets for 40 years. I feel there is less competition. There is more customer loyalty. And it's much easier, even during a pandemic, we support each other in premium markets. Whereas in the bottom of the pyramid, you get too much competition. And, and it's during pandemics that you really have to struggle because the competition will kill you. So I think the le lesson to learn is to, to go up in the value chain and try to add value and reach up to the, the upper markets. Now, one of the best uh, brand propositions or, or brand images that Sri Lanka can get in agriculture is to be 100% chemical free. Now, a lot of people are uh, hung up on the short term. Now, yes, the short term is very important. And I, and I hope and pray that we will be able to support the farmers during this short term while we are converting. But we have a fantastic opportunity four years down the road when we will be the first country in the world to be 100% chemical free. And I am, I am almost certain that in four or five years, the compliance for chemical free uh, imports is going to be very tough uh, in European and, and American markets where we export most of our products to. And I think that even China today has started this, you know, it, it's today, I think after the COVID, this is going to be mandatorily necessary. And that is the environmental, social and social governance or the social entrepreneurship where we have to look at um, the environment as well as society when we do business. And uh, buyers or especially the premium markets are going to require uh, compliance to that. And, and I think in Sri Lanka, we would be, uh, it would be very important for us to think four years, five years down the road when we can get a premium price for our agriculture and that money should be converted to the producer so that our farmers can have a better livelihood. You know, it's quite a challenge when you think back that in 200 years, growing the best tea in the world, we cannot be happy with the livelihoods of the tea plantation workers today. You know, now if that is going to change, we have to make a big difference in the market, in, in selling our product, because obviously we have to get more money in order to for that money to trickle down to the uh, to the growers so this is this is one of the reasons that that it's very important for us to look at the premium markets and also today if you ask the successful exporters in sri lanka everyone will say that their order books are full there is no raw material that we have a, a, a capacity issue that is there is a shortage of raw materials and for the manufacturing factories, they will say they have a shortage of labor. However, there are a lot of people wanting to export, promote exports and thing, you know, want to get into the export market. So we have to really look at skills development for labor and also look at uh, a better way to support the producers, okay? Again, this quality, volume and price issue is something where the farmer needs to be educated and the farmer needs to be uh, understand the, 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 the dynamics of, of the markets. So 
we um, our CMA uh, SME development committee proposed uh, has proposed and we are developing that now uh, uh, an export house which is basically a, a buying house or trading house you may call it but a responsible intermediary between the SME producers and the world market this is a, a in a way a no brainer because if if exporters have a have a platform where they can responsibly engage and and our sme producers can be empowered to engage with that kind of collaboration instead of thinking that they can that can ship black pepper from monaragala to the usa okay we have to help they have to collaborate there is no way that a, that a farmer is going to i mean today they are thinking of putting spice boxes in amazon packets and selling through e-commerce and that we will never upgrade our quality because you know the competition will kill us if we go get that route when as we add value we have to do marketing we have to in, improve our brands and and i believe that we have a fantastic opportunity if we all put collaborate with the sme producers and help them to move up in the in the value chain so those are i think very important uh, aspects today when we look at uh, agricultural produce we have obviously spices uh, we have seen year on year growth uh, in spices even in the world market i think the spices are the most adulterated commodity in the world and today people are wanting single origin you know they there is traceability requirements today with the blockchain technology we have these qr codes where customers in the premium markets are requiring to know where the food is coming from so we have an opportunity because we can be a fabulous place where our we have single origin black pepper single origin cinnamon and we can have premium uh, prices for that in the time to come and even now there are believe it or not there are three, over 350 exporters of organic products into premium markets over 12000 certified organic uh, producers or farmers in the country and some of them have been uh, exporting organic certified product for 30 years so we we have an opportunity to do this and and move up in the value chain fruits and vegetables dehydrated fruits and vegetables after post harvest uh, 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 processing now we have so many what they call superfoods this is immune boosting uh, antioxidant uh, highly nutritious and and we all know that sri lanka has such a fabulous ecosystem and biodiversity that just about every every green in your yard you can make it into some kind of salad and eat it so we we have a lot of opportunity for that type of thing you know to name a few uh, moringa today is fantastic we cannot find enough moringa to 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 export to tell you the truth uh, moringa leaves that are dried and crushed and powdered we have a shortage uh, anything that is produced can be exported we have uh, dried jackfruit young jackfruit uh, dehydrated uh, we have sour sap and and you know of course many more so like that i think that we need to look at those are things we already have it's, it don't have to be it's not rocket science to get this stuff sorted out and exported then and, and i think that will in turn help the rural economies and if we can collaborate to make that happen uh, i believe we can have a strong export economy for sri lanka thank you you on mute nandika i'm sorry <laughs> thanks i think we will keep the questions uh, maybe for the last moment and uh, after having a discussion with uh, others as well uh, i would like to move on to uh, to oshada uh, there again 
as uh, we, we know very specifically the ICT is a sector where we are looking forward to get a couple of billions of dollars. And uh, there again, there is some uh, the, the good progress in that uh, respect as well. Uh, then the, the, also the overview over to IT industry, a major growth sector for export economy on that topic. Thank you, uh, Nandika. And I believe you all can see my screen. I'd like to um, share a few slides as well, in addition to what I speak. Um, can you confirm whether you all can see my screen? We can yes, see also that. Yeah, we can see. Thank you. Thank you. So, in, in fact, uh, first and foremost, thank you for inviting me, uh, CMA Sri Lanka. I think it's an opportune moment that we are discussing about reviving the Sri Lankan economy on a post COVID 19 strategic. Um, perspective and also looking at uh, the IT sector as a major pivot growth sector that may be possibly help Sri Lanka to reposition itself moving forward to the future. So I thought I'll give you some uh, statistics and start off with on that point on what our strategy um, uh, from a um, government perspective as well. So if you look at the glimpse of uh, the Sri Lanka statistics from a IT industry perspective, um, today, our GDP contribution is at about a, approximate 0.2%. As most of you all would know also, the revenue from the industry stood at a, a, a US dollar 1.2 billion, uh, looking at the statistics of last year. Now, there's always been a debate about the central bank statistics versus the IT industry statistics. I think that's been cleared out. Um, and um, our uh, statistics stands, uh, I can give further elaboration on that if required on the questions and answers session. Um, interestingly, uh, as Mr. Dimel also mentioned, you know, as much as we focus on the, um, the the other sectors, the traditional export sectors, if you see the year-on-year -year growth on the IT industry sector, it's phenomenal, and I believe this can also increase furthermore, and, and I believe it can um, in, in increment in a very um, aggressive way if we basically positioning position ourselves uh, with the key demographics and the key segments uh, as we go on. Um, the IT industry is also right now the fifth largest export earner of the country. Um, if you look at our skill force right now, um, these are the statistics uh, uh, from the last year as well. So we stand at approximately about 150,000 in terms of uh, the IT industry workforce right now we have. Um, the computer literacy, it's again debatable, it's at about 71%, but what's important right now is more than the computer literacy is to look at the digital lit literacy. So that's a huge difference between what computer literacy as a uh, uh, comparison to what digital literacy is. So as we go along, our most um, uh, focus should be on ensuring that we increase the digital literacy. Uh, we know so many events and incidents as we go along, it's very important that we capture the new paradigms of information security, the required uh, harmonization of um, uh, processes that has to come into play to ensure that as much as we introduce high technology and the best of the breed software, it's very important that we introduce the governance frameworks as well. And also we need to ensure the public is trained, um, the respective um, uh, employees are trained in terms of utilizing these um, uh, products, these sort of new environments, new digital environments with a prudent um, uh, and holistic uh, governance framework. So this is what digital literacy means. And we have about uh, 400 IT companies. And of course we have some uh, multinational companies who are operating in Sri Lanka. That's going to be a very key pivot point when we move on uh, to expanding on, on how we look at uh, supporting uh, a future digital economy and more importantly support in the export sector. So today we have a um, bold vision of hitting 3 billion US dollars by 2024. You would have heard about a number of 5 billion US dollars that was basically floating around for the last so many years. Um, and I think it's, it's, it has been the right moment that we recalibrated that. Uh, because I'll be very upfront uh, and be realistic. You know, you cannot just go on to a $5 billion mark without ensuring that, again, we harmonize other key imperatives in the country. We have to look at the capacity uh, building in terms of our IT skills and the workforce. You can't just, you know, extrapolate a number of $5 billion without doing that. Um, so this time around, as you would see from my slides, uh, we've taken a very scientific approach and a very realistic one at that to ensure that we look at a $3 billion mark, um, uh, hopefully by 2024, and also look at key parallels that we have to address, for example, in terms of skill building and capacity planning, as well as ensuring we create a robust export uh, readiness for the country. So this is the statistics of worldwide IT spending forecast as per July 2021. 
Uh, this based on uh, the Gartner Group, as you would know, Gartner is the apex, you know, key benchmarking for IT industry from a global perspective. Um, there's some interesting statistics that we uh, peg ourselves on when we look at our local strategy. So if you look at uh, these numbers, um, interestingly, Gartner has said that there's going to again be exponential growth across the IT spending. Of course, uh, triggered by the black swan that we face right now of the COVID-19 pandemic. If there is any positives to come out of this pandemic, I believe it's the rapid digitalization and the acceleration of digitalization. Um, when you see these numbers, the data center systems, we are talking uh, in US dollar billions over here. Um, you would see from 2021 to 2022, how it's basically um, uh, accelerating up to uh, 200, 201 US, US dollars in terms of um, 201 billion dollars. Enterprise software is also going to ramp up from uh, 598 um, billion US dollars to 669 um, uh, billion US dollars by next year. Um, the devices market is the same, but that's something that we may not be able to leverage uh, maximum on, of course, based on uh, how we're placed strategically. But IT services, again, which we are well, well entrenched in the IT industry today, um, you can see um, the, the phenomenal aspect. It is cutting across so one trillion US dollars. So this is uh, the key specific, I think, we have to leverage and pivot around. And you could see the overall IT uh, spending over here when we talk about it. It's cutting across close to five um, trillion US dollars. And this is the opportunity we have to tap on to. But right now, what we need to understand is how are we going to tap onto this with a, a very well articulated strategy moving forward. So I just want to give you all some perspective on the opportunity there is when we look at it. When you look at the global outsourcing market, um, in 2019, the global outsourcing industry in itself just the outsourcing industry uh, basically stood at uh, US dollars 92.5 billion. And of course, it is expected to grow again uh, to 114 billion, if not more, uh, by 2025, right? I mean, these are again based on Gartner forecasts. Um, you could see on the left um, certain countries and regions that has been highlighted, right? As uh, uh, it's, it's based on the Tholon's uh, Service Globalization Index of 2020 and off offshore development countries that has been identified uh, as part of the top 50 digital nations in the world. Now, these are the points that we need to come, come into everybody in my perspective. When you see Asia, of course, we see um, uh, our neighbors, India, um, and of course, the Far East, the Vietnams, Philippines, and the Indonesias. Now, when we really look at it, um, we are getting a lot of new competition coming through, also from the likes of Vietnam and Philippines. And we have some serious challenges we ourselves has to fix. Uh, locally, as much as we look at this $3 billion mark as the IT industry, we are facing a severe challenge in terms of uh, the skill sets required locally, the ramp up of um, the human capital as we require. So this is a, quite a challenge that we need to address, of course, when we um, uh, look at uh, this on a holistic way. Um, our goals and milestones are pretty well articulated this time around. So these are the numbers and the key point, uh, key uh, KPIs that we set for ourselves. You could see a couple of strategic horizons that we picked ourselves from 2020 to 2022 and 2024, right? So as I mentioned, uh, it's going to cut across um, key specific layers. We are looking at technology industry development. We are going to look at startup ecosystem development. I will elaborate a bit more uh, with the examples of what we're going to do um, uh, in a while. Uh, we are also looking at technology diffusion and capacity building as well as regional cluster development. It is imperative that we basically take this narrative out across um, the country and not just basically pivot around uh, the known base of technology within Colombo. So this uh, a key uh, aspect we are looking at as the ICTA agency being the apex body in driving the digitalization vision of the country. Um, now, when you look at the 2020 horizon, we were at, as I mentioned, at about a $1.2 billion market in export re revenue. We had 400 tech companies as we um, uh, go on today. Um, our startup ecosystem is absolutely vi vibrant. Uh, we have 400 startups. In fact, we put a lot of focus in ensuring we empower and accelerate our local startups, which I believe is going to be the differentiate at the end of the day, which is going to set us apart from our competing other different destinations and countries. I think I, I think a lot more has to be done in terms of encouraging our startups. Um, um, I'm coming from the industry, so I can be very upfront and with Canada, I can state our financial systems are way backward and then the way the support systems are placed are not very conducive, conducive in, in terms of uh, 
sparking entrepreneurship, specifically tech entrepreneurship, where traditional collateral systems used by our local government systems, or sorry, local uh, banking systems, are not really going to be a match uh, for the acceleration and the empowerment that the industry looks at, the startups looks at. So eventually, if we do not change these things, we are again only just going to have a number in terms of this export mark, and we are never going to be able to achieve it because at the end of the day, we need uh, more and more new startups that successful new ventures coming into play to support uh, this growth uh, spurt that we are looking at. So it's very important again uh, that we look at other uh, ancillary services and then policy making has to align to ensure that this is supported. So today, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 these are the numbers we look at, but by 2022, we are looking at accelerating it to 1.8 billion US dollars in export revenue when you look at the ITBPO market. Um, we want to expand uh, the tech company footprint from 400 to 550 by 2022. Of course, right now we are the third quarter of 2021. Um, well, we cannot help it, but COVID has put a spanner in our work, well, um, uh, which, which we cannot help. But of course, what we are still looking at is keep keeping on that momentum to ensure we come close to that. In fact, in 2021, we predict uh, the earnings of the IT export sector to hit the 1.5, 1.6 uh, billion US dollar mark as we speak. And we are also looking at expanding our startup uh, ecosystem, the footprint to 600 startups. Again, we are not only looking at the startups, we are looking at uh, expanding uh, the technology for SMEs, the small medium scale enterprises in ensuring that we encourage and enable them with technology. We believe that will also indirectly support uh, the export sector as well, because introduction of technology if done the right way is going to make all of these organizations more agile and more competitive when you look at the global market as well. Of course, as I mentioned, um, at the end of the day, capacity building is the imperative that we need to break through on. We need to, by 2022, increase our uh, IT professionals, the capacity is to 225,000, and also by 2024 to 300,000. If you fail at this, um, um, it is so obvious if we are going to fail on the $3 billion mark. So it's, it's important that we keep a focus on all of these key parallels and keep on achieving this. Again, otherwise it'll, it'll be just uh, a fad and it'll be just lip service as we've been discussing forever for the last so many years. And I think it's about time as a country, uh, we put um, uh, uh, real results on the table and we drive through a proper strategy. And I think it, it, it'll take a, a whole of government approach and beyond that also a strong collaboration uh, of a public-private uh, par partnership when we go on this path, because it's very important that we collaborate and, and we get out of the archaic uh, uh, um, uh, silos that we've been working on, and we need to break away from that. Uh, again, I think it's, it's quite key on this. So you'd see on this uh, snapshot of how we want to uh, achieve the $3 billion by 2024. It is not just a number, it, it, it's uh, well-planned, and we are cutting across uh, a lot of horizontals on this aspect. So go, to go to a bit more specifics on this. So on the technology industry development uh, in terms of uh, focusing on the export revenue, um, we, are, we are looking at um, enabling all of these organizations with a lot of readiness. Um, we are looking at the startup ecosystem. Uh, we are looking at mentoring. We are looking at funding. Um, we are looking at expanding the angel investments. We are looking at uh, expanding the seed funding, uh, and we are looking at expanding the capacities and then the opportunities they would have uh, in terms of accessing uh, required funding from even traditional banking um, systems in play. Um, if not, again, uh, we'll be just talking about a thousand startup ecosystem. Again, we will certainly fall behind if we cannot achieve that. And of course, to achieve that, we will, of course, require the support from the BFI size sector. And also, of course, we will have to establish more and more um, uh, funding networks in Sri Lanka for this. Tech diffusion, again, is a, it's a quite a key aspect that I mentioned earlier as well. Technology diffusion is diffusing technology to non-tech areas. It's, it's an imperative that we do that. For example, when we talk about um, uh, a digital economy, uh, ease of doing business is very, very important. So for example, um, uh, I think one of um, the previous panelists spoke about uh, ensuring we get more and more MNCs to Sri Lanka. I think there was an example given uh, about one entity going into 1,000 seats uh, uh, within a year by setting up of Sri in Sri Lanka. Uh, but of course, uh, what mechanisms do we have to ensure that they can, it's, it's, it's a real ease of doing business and work environment or in Sri Lanka. For example, can we like Singapore ensure that a, 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 a foreign organization or international organization to spin up a corporate entity within half a day like Singapore does? 
I mean, it's pretty seamless. Um, we cannot expect to engage them if we don't have these specifics uh, of technology diffusion. Uh, today we are talking about a digital nomad program uh, that the Ministry of uh, Tourism, Sri Lanka Tourism has introduced. We just have been having a conversation across the last um, uh, few days in ensuring how we bring in technology to ensure they have a seamless use experience in terms of applying for this visa. We have to think uh, that the digital nomads, if you are going to attract them, of course, it's going to bring in a lot of uh, revenue to Sri Lanka. And more importantly, if we, if we succeed in that, we are going to create a larger pool of advocacy for Sri Lanka. There'll be advocates that when they go back and um, ensure that they advocate more business for Sri Lanka, more setting up of services in Sri Lanka. So I think these are examples of why tech diffusion is required across even non-tech uh, um, uh, entities. Uh, it could be public, it could be the private entities. It's very important we harmonize all of these aspects. Capacity building again, now very important. Uh, we need to look at from a get go of the current curricula as well. We need to look at the school programs as we go on as well. Uh, we need to be sure that the current IT education is in sync uh, with the requirements of the uh, midterm and the long-term uh, requirements. We need to look at blockchains. We need to look at IOTs. Is our curriculum ready for that? Um, do we have accessibility to children to start get going on uh, uh, coding or even access to this sort of technological studies from the get-go? Um, we have open source systems such as Scratch that um, certain schools have access to and not, unfortunately certain schools doesn't have. Um, so we need to also go back and ensure we look at the curriculum, both from a, um, a K-12 system to also very importantly the education system in the university uh, aspect. Because when we get these grads out uh, into play, uh, they should have the basic skill sets that is required by potential uh, MNCs that has uh, set up in Sri Lanka in the future. Um, the regional cluster development, again, as I mentioned, we are looking at taking this cluster development out of um, Colombo area. Uh, we've created startup hubs. Uh, the UA startup hub is absolutely vibrant uh, startup hub um, that, that's going quite well. Uh, we, we set up another hub uh, just uh, last month as well. Um, and, and it's very important to note even today, the best of the breed IoT organizations are not based in Colombo. They are based in Waunia, they are based in the Jaffna district. Um, so we have some best of the breed uh, uh, organi organizations, tech startups coming from uh, all of these places. All what they need is the infrastructure. Now that's a, a pertinent point that I would like to elaborate wearing my TRC hat. Um, as you would know, uh, today um, we have a severe challenge of connectivity uh, because, again, uh, for the overnight uh, requirements and the, 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 um, uh, the challenge created in terms of the demand overnight for additional um, bandwidth, additional connectivity because of the complete new phenomena of working from home and studying from home. Uh, today, as we spoke about, including this session, is completely online. Today, almost 90% of our economy is driven on the telecommunication infrastructure as we speak. Um, almost all organizations are online, both public and private. Of course, there are areas of improvements. So the Government of Sunday Medina program uh, that we have initiated from TRC, not many people know about it, although the negatives are talked in the media. Uh, no, 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 not many people talk about the positives uh, of the programs that's in play. So the Government of Sunday Medina program that we've initiated that in fact, before COVID, we just started off it in December 2019, as soon as I took over, because we understood we need to have the basic infrastructure in play if we are to again go for these numbers and if we are to attract these uh, MNCs to set up in Sri Lanka and for Sri Lanka to be positioned as a tech and innovation hub. So the government of Sandy Medina, or in English, it transforms into what it calls a Connect Sri Lanka program. We, in fact, for the first time in 15 years, are investing in rural connectivity through the telecom development levy. Now, unfortunately, um, if you look at the last uh, 15 years, this uh, investment has not been done. Um, and the telecommunications sector has only been looked at as just a taxation haven. So how do we expect the telecommunication industry to actually go and uh, ensure that they uh, set up uh, infrastructure when there's no incentive from the government and then the public sector to ensure there's some sort of incentive for them to go into areas that does not make typical financial sense. We need to understand these are listed organizations. Of course, um, they, 
they look at uh, their bottom line. But every country has a concept of universal service obligation fund in this manner. And right now, I'm glad to state that we have initiated that. Uh, our own universal service obligation fund is our telecom development fund. And right now, we are investing 50% uh, uh, of investment of all rural uh, connectivity programs that's going on. So I just came out of a meeting as we speak. Um, you've taken it on a, um, a district level. Um, there's no way we can take it on a piecemeal strategy. Uh, we have to take it on district level because there's so many areas that requires connectivity. Um, so we've done a, a year long program last year in terms of gathering data across 14,000, all 14,000 Grammar Ildari divisions. That's the most granular piece of administrative um, block in Sri Lanka. Uh, today, I'm glad to say that in Ratnapura, we've launched the program. There's 37 tower infrastructures coming up as we speak. Um, out of that, already 10 have been uh, gone live. Um, as we speak, every week we see now towers coming up live because the construction takes a considerable time. Um, so we look forward to basically covering the whole of the Ratnapura district by uh, end of November. Hopefully it got pushed back because of the COVID implications. We've also launched uh, work in the Kurunagala district. Uh, 48 tower infrastructures are coming in uh, over there, where today, in fact, even we just had a meeting with all the government, local government authorities in that district to ensure that all the approvals are taken and TRC becomes a core one stop shop to ensure that we don't have any lags on that. Matra district was launched just last week. We are bringing in 27 new tower infrastructures. Now, you may wonder how we are going to cover whole of these districts by this uh, less amount of towers. So interestingly, we are going on a complete um, tower sharing model right now. So go on on the days that tower, tower operators or rather the telecom operators are going to have their own towers next to each other. Uh, so each tower is pretty much uh, shared across all operators because TRC is heading it. Um, and also, um, uh, I'm going into detail on this because it's a key imperative. And also, um, uh, interestingly, we've spun off a local industry while we are doing this. For the first time, we are developing and we are manufacturing our own towers in Sri Lanka from uh, early this year. So in fact, everyone um, was very um, uh, negative or very circumspect whether we can match the uh, import rates. But just the last um, uh, meeting I had with the telco CEOs, I've been told that the local tower manufacturing are the most cost effective and the highest in the quality. In fact, this in itself can become a uh, export industry where we can continue to export this uh, uh, telecommunication towers from Sri Lanka in the future to emerging markets. Uh, we are the first also last month to um, uh, introduce our own submarine cable resilience and protection framework in Asia. It's important again when you talk about tapping into that data center market. Um, MNCs are not going to come here without a proper uh, uh, guarantee that the backbone, the international backbones are protected. So in fact, uh, we are the first country we worked with the UN ODC and it was, uh, we were assisted by the uh, government of Japan. I should be thankful. And we've rolled out the first draft and we are going through the um, uh, legalities of it with the Tony generals in ensuring that we, we uh, guess it and draft it through. So these are a few of the examples of how serious the focus is this time. We are looking at the infrastructure side and also we are looking at the other layers that's required. So um, going on again, um, how are you going to reach this 3 billion? I won't go into the details of all of these aspects for the, uh, uh, the, the time because of the time limitation. But if you look at the capacity building and export readiness, we are engaging right now with all of the international, um, our own embassy uh, ecosystem uh, and ensuring that we engage them and we ensure that we utilize our uh, diplomatic missions to ensure that we create traction in identified markets. Uh, we are, we've introduced um, incentivized certification programs in reskilling and upskilling um, uh, uh, certain select uh, target audiences in IT uh, skills and BPM skills. Um, we are organizing trade missions, unfortunately, and road shows that has been hampered by COVID, but we are changing our strategy because we cannot uh, wait for COVID to clear out. Um, we are looking at different other strategies, as I mentioned, by strongly engaging with uh, uh, our own uh, embassy network. And I should state, for example, our German uh, embassy is supporting us quite aggressively. Um, Her Excellency Manu Rinambuwe is the em ambassador over there. And in fact, we have just launched our first digital nomad program. Uh, with the free funding that uh, is done by the uh, Sri Lankan consulate over there to ensure that we kick off uh, that sort of uh, aspects from there. Not only that, we are also looking at uh, accessing uh, startup ecosystems in Berlin. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a very vibrant ecosystem. So this is the way forward, I guess. We need to ensure we look at our uh, current capacities, we look at our current strengths and play to it. Uh, we are looking at investments as well in ensuring that we, we ensure that Sri Lanka comes out as a key location. 
Uh, we have a lot of um, certifications, the GSLI index. We are talking about the Gartner index that has uh, put us in, in, in um, uh, good stead as a, a top tier destination to outsource. But we are looking at ensuring that these reports are updated as well as we go along. These are some of the things, as I mentioned, establishing ambassadorships across the diaspora we have. Um, we are looking at organizing inward visits rather than the traditional way of you know, going out for road shows. We are looking at whether the possibility of funding certain top MNC uh, personnel to come to Sri Lanka and experience them, you know, experience Sri Lanka in itself in terms of both the IT sector and what the, uh, what the, um, uh, the country has to offer. And again, at this point, I should say, again, uh, as part of the Ministry of Technology Initiative under the president himself, um, the five techno parks that was envisioned are just now kicking off. And in fact, uh, uh, just the cabinet paper came through just last week, and there's going to be five techno parks established. Uh, the first one coming in Gaul. We are talking about 240,000 square feet. Uh, we are moving uh, on from a traditional brick and mortar approach to a more of a IT city. So it's not going to only have uh, have the plug and play brick and mortar environments. It's going to have its own environments to ensure the digital nomads, the new generation sees come in and enjoy. It's a work hard, play hard environment. Um, it's a bit of surf and code concept that can come up in Sri Lanka. Um, so Gaul is the first um, location. And in fact, Kurunagala, um, uh, it's going to be a, a transit um, a techno park coming over there. Uh, the third one is in Digana Candy that's coming on overlooking the Victoria uh, Reservoir, uh, a few minutes away from the golf course, the Victoria Golf Course. So all of these locations has been um, very strategically selected uh, and, and, and we are going through with it. In fact, I think this week we should be forming the organization and the entity to basically continue the next steps. So it's a couple of, couple of examples. The startup ecosystem, as I said, one of my key passionate areas and priorities. We just launched the 10,000 idea campaign just last week by ICTA. Um, we are moving to ensure that we increase the funding that we have for our own spiralization program uh, that is assisting and giving seed funding for select um, uh, startups. Um, in fact, I requested um, increasing it by five times this year and hopefully I'm not shut down by the treasury um, because I believe this is where um, our, our inflection point would be as a country. And if we don't back up our future startup ecosystem, I think we are going to come back to uh, square one. Um, and I believe very simply, just imagine one of these startups going on to become a, a, a unicorn company, that which means a value, valued company at US, 1 billion US dollars. And it's absolutely uh, possible. And we are also ensuring that we only do, do not go uh, on encouraging only service, uh, uh, service IT companies. We are looking at our own products uh, from Sri Lanka. It's very important we, we look at the $3 billion mark not only from just IT services, we are going to look at it from ensuring we create local intellectual property, local products. Um, in fact, uh, I can mention a few products that has gone across the world, you know, I mean, travel box, board pack. I mean, these are products that has cut across different markets in the world and pretty much sits and basically are used in uh, Fortune 100 uh, organizations starting off from their own uh, board uh, meetings. So this is the encouragement we need to ensure that we focus on the productization as well. As much as we've been um, patient as a service industry for the couple, last couple of many years, that's a good start. But we need to ensure now to hyper accelerate to that $3 billion mark, we need to ensure that we uh, ensure we empower the local IT product companies as well. How, how are we going to do it? Um, ICTA's vision has completely transformed. Uh, we are not going to do our own product development anymore moving forward. I'm absolutely vehemently against it. And I believe it, the way forward is ensuring that we engage the local industry. The local industry has to be utilized to develop this product that's required for our own digitalization as a country. We shouldn't, we should give priority to local products um, and we should ensure that they can use Sri Lanka as the springboard. They can use Sri Lanka as their home ground as well as the playground to ensure that they get their products right. And once they get that, I'm absolutely confident that these products can be taken out to uh, the international arena and they can bring us significant foreign revenue. And, and this, I, I think we can, we can scale up even beyond uh, 3 billion US dollar mark that we are looking at. But of course we need to focus on these specifics. So technology diffusion, I've already talked about capacity building again. We are partnering with the Skills Council of Sri Lanka. We are partnering with so many other entities it is. Um, there's a lot of support that uh, uh, we are getting from the MNC set up in Sri Lanka, the industry, in terms of doing these capacity buildings and bringing it to the school level, as well as also the uh, university level and also doing lateral training as well. 
for non-IT skilled people. Because at the end of the day, we have two parts to go. One is the local digitalization. That in itself is going to require a lot of labor force. And number two, we will need the labor force coming into the export part. So we need to get this capacity building right. I've been reiterated quite a few times because I think this is the make or break uh, on this strategy. Right. Some of the Sri Lanka's performances in terms of the global indices. Um, AT Kearney um, has put us uh, on the top 25 countries in 2021 uh, in terms of the GSLI index. Uh, Tholons again uh, has put us 34th globally. Um, and all of this uh, basically substantiates and gives credibility in positioning Sri Lanka. And it's still uh, earlier on, uh, one of the uh, panelists also talk, talked about it. And in fact, uh, I'm just in, I'll give a very good example, Amazon, uh, I got Amazon to visit three weeks back and Amazon visited Sri Lanka and we are in discussions with them. We're in discussions with the likes of Alibaba's to look at them setting up here in Sri Lanka. So I think uh, that's huge potential uh, uh, for Sri Lanka to be positioned uh, as a global uh, and a regional hub for um, uh, technology and innovation and all for digital nomads. I think if we get this right, um, I might be bold enough to say that we have the Sri Lankan economy. I think um, we can be assured that if we can focus on this front, of course, with giving also much required prominence to other industries as well, I think uh, we can make a very fast uh, ch change uh, on the outlook of our economy if we can go on this front. So summary of some key priorities that I've already mentioned. So with that, uh, without further ado, I will uh, uh, in my update on that and pass it over back to uh, Nandika. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Joseph. I think there will be a lot of corrections and a lot of uh, 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 new things uh, to be discussed. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will just move into uh, the ne next uh, speaker. Uh, but we'll definitely come back uh, with corrections to you, Joseph. Uh, and quite revealing uh, kind of presentation. Uh, now, I uh, would like to invite uh, the Suhashini to uh, take over uh, the Global Trends in Export Economy uh, Lessons for Sri Lanka, what we can learn. Thank you. Uh, I hope you all can hear me clear and I hope you can see my slides as well. Yeah, yep. yeah we can Great. see ourselves, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, thank you very much for the invitation to talk about a topic that is close to my heart, growing exports. Uh, just to uh, tell you basically the outline of my presentation today. First, I will look at the targets Sri Lanka has set for its exports. These are targets for product exports, not the services exports, and how we have fared against the targets, what is our reality. And then I will move on to global trends and missed opportunities, basically trying to understand why did we fail to achieve our targets and why are we doing worse than some of the other neighboring Asian economies who are doing far better. And then lastly, I will try to sum up, uh, giving some lessons to take away. So where do we stand now against where we wanted to be, targets versus reality? So in 2011, April 2011, uh, there was an announcement by the Export Development Board that Sri Lanka aims to increase its exports to 20 billion US dollars by 2020. And this was given much publicity across media. Now we are in 2021. Where are we against our targets? So basically where we stand is uh, our actual uh, GDP uh, is, um, sorry, actual exports it's unfair to take 2020 because it's a bad year, but at the best years, we have only reached 12 billion US dollars against the target we have set. And the gap is wide. So it's very important for us to understand what happened. But some may wonder whether we were trying, attempting to do in the impossible. Were we being too ambitious, trying to more than double our exports in 10 years? I just looked at some of the other countries in Asia and tried to see how, has they, how have they done. These are some examples from the region. Vietnam, during the same period, has increased its exports four times. Cambodia, nearly three times. Laos, just about three times. Myanmar doubled its exports. And what I found most interesting is Myanmar and Sri Lanka seems to have started at the same level but Myanmar seems to have done far better. I took 2019 because 2020 was an unfair year to take, but I must admit most countries in the East Asian and South Asia, Southeast Asian 
region have actually not seen a decline in their exports, especially countries have, like Vietnam have seen rapid growth even in 2020. And this is again a story I think a lot of people talk about, even the previous panelists spoke about, where we say what happened to Sri Lanka and Vietnam. The two countries were at the same level in 1993, and today look at the widening gap. It is, it is a massive gap in, in exports, where Vietnam is and where we are. Then quickly to understand what was the difference between us and others who did better. It is very important to realize, uh, for us to learn, what can we learn from them? And this is where my diagnosis frequently differs from many others. A lot of people say it is our problem is diversification. I disagree. I say our export problem is that our exports are totally out of, uh, totally out of sync with global trends. We have tried to grow exports while ignoring the most important developments that has taken place in the world market. We wanted to cater to the world market, but even to this date, we look at our local market then and think if we grow our exports based on our resources and what our consumers need as import substitutes, that is the sure way of winning exports. But one lesson we can learn from our neighbors who have done far better in this sector is that is a big mistake. If you're catering to the global market, be mindful of what is going in the global market. If you are not uh, tuned in with what is, global trends and developments, you will miss many opportunities like we have done in the past. And one of the critical reasons for the success of our neighbors is that they have been very much in sync with global developments. I'm going to just highlight two things that happened in the world market towards the latter part of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century that made uh, the way we trade and produce goods very, very different from the way it used to be. But Sri Lanka still seemed to be stuck in the uh, early part of the 21st century and think, uh, and think of export strategy that suits that period while being, uh, uh, while without taking into consideration what has happened since then. First, one of the biggest opportunities we missed is benefiting from Asia's rapid growth, integrating with Asia. As an Asian country that is located in a very strategic location that provides excellent connectivity to the rest of the world, we have failed to benefit from Asia's rapid growth. Two countries, rise of Japan and China, really made a major difference in Asia and how Asia is viewed and evolved over the years. One of the things that Japan and China managed to do is they became, within a very short period, very important trading partners, very important markets for the rest of the world. The second one was they became very important sources of foreign direct investment. And together with Japan and China, what happened is even developing Asia saw a rapid increase in its share of exports in the world. Today, developing Asia accounts for nearly 40% of exports in the world, but Sri Lanka sadly missed this opportunity. If you look at these massive two markets in Asia, Japan and China, how much have we been, what, to what extent have we been able to export to these markets, enter these markets? Look at our track record. By 2001, you can see how important Japan and even China at that time, which was not a major trading partner, to our East Asian and Southeast Asian neighbors. And look at where we were. We hardly exported anything to Japan and China to, and look at 2019. Of course, they have increased their overall share of exports to both countries. Japan's share has declined because Japan's trading share overall has declined in the world. But you can see how important China is for the East Asian countries compared to Sri Lanka. We are very good at importing from Japan and China. When Japan was a major trading partner in the world, we I think at one time Japan accounted for a good 14% of Sri Lanka's imports. And today China accounts for a good 20% of Sri Lanka's imports. 
but we hardly export to these countries. And that is a key difference between why we lagged behind while our East Asian and South Asian neighbors so rapid growth in their exports. The second one, foreign direct investment. Investments and trade were very, very closely related in Asia's growth. When Japan was a major source of foreign direct investment, where did most of their investment go to? Asia. And today, China is a major investor in the world. Where does most of their foreign investments go to? Asia. But to Sri Lanka, the only thing we got from Japan at the heydays of Japan was foreign loans. And from China, the heydays of China, what are we getting from China? Foreign loans, not foreign investment, which is a big mistake we did with Japan and we seem to be repeating the same with China. Look at the track record of FDI of our neighbors. They have seen rapid growth in foreign direct investments into their regions. Where does Sri Lanka stand? We had a very, very poor track record of foreign investments. You can find all the excuses and the reasons, but the reality is we missed an opportunity. We missed a great opportunity, and that is why they did far better than us and we left behind. Then the second biggest opportunity that we missed, integrating with global supply chains. I'm sure most of you in the audience would have heard about global value chains, global supply chains, how Sri Lanka should be integrated, but where do we stand? How, how successful have we been? What do I mean by global supply chains? This is because of remarkable advances in information, communication, transport technologies, and dramatic reduction in tariffs across the world. There was this idea that companies felt, I don't need to produce everything in my country or even near my country. I can produce the parts of my products across the globe. That is called slicing of production across countries. It increased efficiency, it lowered production, it speed up production and became a major source of competitiveness for most global companies in the world. And these global value chains in reality are a lot more regional than people think. We have the Asian value chain. In 2000, Japan led the Asia value chain. It was at the center of Asian value chain where Japan used to invest in many other countries and get them to build components, parts, and uh, export back to their own country. So, so Japan was at the center of these value chains and Asian value chains really was one major reason why most East Asians saw massive growth in their exports. And now it's shifted to China. In 2017, the value chains, Japan still remains important. We have Korea, Taiwan, but we have China, which is at the center of these uh, Asian supply chains and very much a part of Asia's growth story. And what did this do to global trade? This did a massive change to global trade. Before global supply chains, global trade was about sectors. I export A product in exchange for B product, right? And import B product. But all of a sudden it has become trade in parts and components, not final products. And, and I will come to that later. And nearly 50% of today's world trade is in what we call the intermediate products. These are parts and components uh, uh, of various uh, products that keeps on crossing, sometimes not just once, twice, a single border. And it, it is valued around 8 trillion US dollars. And actually, when it comes to imports, because when you're doing in parts and components, what a lot of people don't realize is you grow your imports too, because you import, you add value when you export. So 60% of imports into Asia was in intermediate products. And let's look at basically some of the key products that really got their production internationalized. This is electrical machinery, machinery and automotive industry. And where is Sri Lanka in these industries that became part of these global supply chains compared to our, our neighbors? You can see where we are. For these, these are the top three products minus oil in the world uh, that accounts for 35% of the world trade. And look how much of these sectors contribute to the total export earnings of our neighbors compared to us. 
So we really miss the bus. And then while missing the bus, we missed another thing. It's basically shifting our development thinking and our industrial strategy, export strategy from 20th century to 21st century. Because before the global supply chains, when you think of industrialization, building industrial base, it was a lot about building the industrial value chain from scratch in your own country, like how the Americans did or the British did or the Germans did. But advent of global supply chains changed entirely that development paradigm. And it changed it to a way where countries could join manufacturing value chains and start exporting manufacturing products without having to build your uh, manufacturing value chain from scratch. You just join a value chain. You don't build a value chain. Unfortunately, we are still stuck in an era when we think of industrial policy to export policy in an era before global supply chains. And that has been a major mistake in overall development thinking of the country because we have not understood the massive change that has taken place in production or manufacturing in the world uh, during the latter part of 20th century going into the 21st century. Okay, now I come to the lessons. What does all this mean for us? Lesson one, many of the people would say, if this was profitable, if there was an opportunity, why didn't Sri Lankan entrepreneurs, exporters make use of it? This is the most important lesson that I think any policymaker or any government can uh, must understand. And maybe the previous speaker also alluded to it. There are things that are beyond the control of the exporters domestic barriers to trade. These are barriers that are erected by the governments that block ability of the entrepreneurs to actually make use of opportunities that emerge in the world. I, I identify four barriers that simply undermine the com competitiveness of any Sri Lankan businessman or trader, one, consistency. When you change policies overnight with very little consultation, very little um, uh, period to uh, adjust uh, for, the, for the industry, uh, business sectors that are affected, that creates, that increases the risk of doing business. And the previous speaker was talking about ease of doing business. It's not just ease of doing business, but how predictable your business environment is. If you're basically changing your goalpost every frequently, then how can the players be expected to play and succeed, right? And the second is regulatory barriers. Sri Lanka has a lot of archaic regulations uh, which needs to be revised, reformed. And there are a lot of sectors we don't have regulations which should be heavy. Procedural barriers. We have very complex time consuming regulations and regulatory procedures that really, and which has enormous bureaucratic discretion uh, built into these procedures. Lastly, information barriers. It's so difficult for a trader or a businessman just to find out what are the rules and the regulations that they need to comply with. How are they going to comply with? Who are they? Who should they be contacting? What is the procedure? What are the timelines? This information does not come by easily in this country. I'm going to just give you one example of where we, as a, to show how domestic barriers to trade affect business. This is about trade facilitation. We have been talking about trade facilitation for a long time. This is just simple common sense. You simplify, automate, standardize, harmonize your trade procedures. You make it faster and cost efficient and predictable for the traders. And you have, you know, this you obviously help uh, companies to build, increase competitiveness and become an attractive uh, destination for investors. And the previous speaker spoke a lot about agriculture, but I think agriculture is one of the most regulated sectors and really badly in need of better trade facilitation. So the WTO trade facilitation agreement, which was signed recently, I call it the most basic of trade facilitation. Why actually WTO trade facilitation agreement has a lot of things that are common sense that any country should have done without waiting for the WTO to tell them to do it. Look at some of these examples on my screen. Do you think you need the World Trade Organization to tell you to do these things? Aren't these things just good for you if you do them? Does, aren't these things really necessary for any country to have a ease of business, increases of business, reduce cost of doing business? 
And however, we have to wait for the WTO to do it. But I want to say, tell you the other countries who succeeded, especially East Asian neighbors, didn't wait for the WTO trade agreement to come and tell them, you need to do trade facilitation. When the trade facilitation came into the existence, WTO said, you decide what you want to do. You have all these provisions. You decide what are the provisions you want to immediately implement. And we'll put it into something called category A. What are the provisions? You need some time because you're not really ready. You need some time. We will put, but you can do it on your own. We will put it to category B. And then what are the category C? These are ones that you find very difficult. You need a lot more time and you can't do without assistance. Assistance from other countries. I need technical advice. I need, uh, I need funding. And then let's see how did Sri Lanka go about doing this and how did the others went about doing it? Look at this table. This is from the WTO database. And you can see countries like Singapore and South Korea has said, we are ready to do immediately implement everything 100% because they started this far before uh, WTO ever thought of doing this agreement because they knew it is good for their country. And they have reaped the benefits of uh, having a very good trading environment, efficient trading environment. And even countries like Malaysia, Thailand were ready to implement immediately over 90%. But what I find most interesting and very sad is category C commitments. Even countries like Vietnam, who are not as ready as the others, just like us, they have saying, oh, we are ready to do less than 30%. But they had confidence of doing the majority of it on their own without any assistance. Sri Lanka, now we, are, we were just completing an, uh, a presentation on the ICT industry and the skills and talent we have on the ICT sector, but Sri Lanka actually went and has said, for 70% of these basic trade facilitation provisions, we need a lot more time and we can't do without external assistance. And to me, this is sad, but this tells you exactly why you can't, you can't expect your businesses to succeed abroad. To the extent, the businesses in your East Asian, Southeast Asian countries have done so. And this is maybe also for to Oshada, this may be an area definitely the ICT sector can come in help automating border agencies, a vital area. We started the story in early 1990s, and it has been nearly three decades, and we are still waiting for our border agencies to be automated. And at the during the time of COVID, we suffered most because we did not actually, we had not taken steps to automate our border agencies. The countries who had done so suffered far less during the pandemic, when there were lockdowns, when there were mobility restrictions, because they could, their board agencies could function online, but ours hardly could. And this is the sad reality we are living in. We talk about digital economy, we talk about electronic government, every successive government comes up with nice policy papers. When how much of it translates into reality is the question. Then what is really important is not to miss the link between trade and investment. You can't grow trade without growing investment. That is one thing East Asia countries told us and taught us. If you're, it's not just removing domestic barriers to trade, you must remove domestic barriers to investment. Just like Oshada said, it must be easy for somebody to start a company, invest. It must be attractive for a multinational company in the world to come and invest in Sri Lanka. That is how the stations grew their exports. Forget trying to promote grow exports, forgetting investment is a big mistake. Then the other thing, data critical. I mean, I'm embarrassed to think I'm not talking about sophisticated data. I'm just talking about availability of simple import and export statistics. How can you develop policy? How can you evaluate policy without trade data, without giving public access to trade data? Because it's not just the government who should have access to data. It's the private sector, the academia, the, the ex other experts in the area who should be having this access. Actually, until early 2021, where the then uh, chairman of the EDB decided to launch an online platform of trade data, Sri Lanka was the only country that did not provide, in South Asia, that did not provide trade statistics online free of charge. I mean, EDB still charges a nominal fee, but I think it was a great step in the right direction by making trade statistics available online. 
but it is not good enough just to have trade know our trade data. We know we need to be able to compare and contrast Sri Lanka's trade data with the rest of the world. And that is exactly why agencies, organizations like United Nations went and created these international databases. So you can actually, whether you are negotiating free trade uh, agreements, whether you are trying to identify opportunities, challenges, understand markets, you have basically trade data of all countries in one place, and it is free online, and it gives very advanced analytical tools, which allows people to, uh, uh, people to really uh, navigate the system and do the analysis. But Sri Lanka hardly updates this trade data on these databases on a regular basis. This, and, and we are today talking about GSP+. Plus. For a long time, we have been talking about India-Sri India, India -Sri Lanka trade agreement, how bad it is. And we've been debating about in the Sri Lanka-Singapore trade agreement. How easy is it for us to find trade data uh, on these trade agreements? How easy is it for me to find, even if I want to do an analysis, does GSP plus benefit Sri Lanka? Uh, Product-wise, uh, GSP utilization data impossible. It is not published and publicly available. So lastly, don't be out of sync with what is happening in the rest of the world. We have just, we are just, you know, going through a massive shock to the global economy. And with any massive shock, the global trade will change. There will be changes that has taken place that will not reverse. Basically, we moved, the world moved. I will tell you how these shocks affected from from the fall of Berlin Wall to the financial crisis is considered by some as an era of hyper-globalization, where the world integrated with the rest of the world very, very fast. But after the financial crisis, it slowed down. And today people are talking about globalization. Is it going to really global integration further slow down after this pandemic, because of this pandemic? This matters if you're growing exports, you need to understand what's happening in your world market. This is just an example to show why this matters. You know, 1999 to 2008, I consider as the golden era of trade. World trade grew faster than the world GDP and it grew at double digit. And you can see during that time, 154 countries more than doubled their exports. Sri Lanka was not among them, but the others did. But you can see after the financial crisis, the trade never, never recovered. It recovered, but never to the previous levels. And you can see how it affects the ability of countries to succeed. Only 34 countries more than doubled their exports during that period. So it's very important for us to understand these changes and how they affect us and the challenges and the opportunities. These are just a few of the things that will definitely shape the global trade regime that anyone who is doing trade policy or export strategies in Sri Lanka need to be mindful of. US and China power rivalry has enormous opportunities as well as challenges. Vietnam is a major country that is benefiting from the fear of US companies of being over-reliant of China and the so-called decoupling. There are a lot of investments flowing into Vietnam because of this, but none is coming to Sri Lanka. And I think Oshada mentioned about the automation, digitization, e-commerce, these were there before, but you would see a rapid acceleration. But at the same time, you see increased protectionism across the world as well. Countries are becoming less and less. This is the globalization you need to be mindful of when you're trying to export. The other countries may not be as open as you think they were. Just like you're rejecting imports from the rest of the world, believe me, the other countries are also rejecting your exports from their countries. So you need to be mindful of that. And then permanent shifts in consumer preferences, lifestyles created by COVID and the supply chain. Supply chains was a major thing in the, in the 21st century, but what will happen to supply chains and how does supply chains react to the risks and disruptions caused by the pandemic? So if we are not mindful of what is going on in the world market, we will not be able to grow our exports and we will miss many more opportunities like we did before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Swajini. Thank you very much uh, for a very detailed uh, discussion about uh, the current trends as well as where we are standing. And uh, there again, what we need to do uh, to accelerate and get away from some, some of these barriers. Uh, so I think I uh, would like to start with uh, Suresh. Now, uh, we have seen, as you, as you correctly mentioned, uh, we have seen a certain amount of uh, improvement in our exports 
as far as spices and certain segments in the agriculture. Uh, but I think uh, when it uh, comes to uh, uh, the volumes and maybe the value, uh, we might have to exponentially improve it as well as the, the grassroots level, uh, how we are going to disseminate the knowledge of branding, how we are going to find uh, the what of the pyramid uh, guys, how we are going to find the market. It's quite challenging. I know you have been working very hard on this and uh, you supported the event chambers for so many things in so many different ways. Uh, but uh, what are the impediments? What are the, the, the huge issues that we have around uh, this uh, branding, uh, taking the people uh, into the markets? Uh, maybe you need to get connected into a kind of a value chain, but that value chain should be very supportive and uh, comprehensive by kind of uh, supporting each other uh, rather than trying to uh, take a maybe cut out of it and uh, there are so many uh, so many the other obstacles uh, as far as the uh, grassroots level the bottom of the pyramid uh, the SMEs uh, what what you what do you normally see there and how we are going to improve some of these uh, maybe a big friction but uh, I know you have a lot of insights thank you Nandika yeah uh, first of all uh, you know, we, in supply chains, we are dealing with uh, SMEs mostly. And it, when you look at the agriculture sector, they are farmers. Now, these people have to be improved to be uh, entrepreneurs because if, they, if the government is subsidizing them and, and then their expectations are like that, right? Now this is this is a sort of a mindset change that needs to happen. Now, uh, for example, my personal experience has been when I, uh, you know, we have to form organizations of farmers, uh, and I think my uh, track record is about fifty percent of the farmers I have been able to make them believers of a uh, better market someday and to work with us and then do the organic agriculture and all that. But ha again, half the farmers uh, will just give it to the first, uh, uh, you know, five rupees more and 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 sell it to, a, you know. You, you, they, we have no long-term uh, thinking. So this is the type of, you know, people want a quick quick instant gratification. That is, I think, those are some attitudinal changes that have to happen, cultural changes that need to happen at the grassroots level. I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a very, very long story, but I think a, a, a solution is collaboration. That if, if the exporters who know what value is now like, all of us who are exporting have a short you know, we, we don't have our supply chain. They are, they, are, they are short of capacity. So if we are, if we work more and more with the supply chains and empower them, then uh, that would be a solution. It's a very slow process in Sri Lanka because uh, of that, again, you know, earlier I talked about the trading mentality. Uh, as opposed to a, a long-term export value addition kind of uh, uh, mentality. And if, if, if there is a loud enough voice, I think we can make this happen. You see, I, I've uh, studied that uh, development is education, organization, and discipline. That is what is lacking, you know? education, organization, and discipline is lacking in our supply chain. So somehow if we can have a concerted effort at making a difference at that level, you see, because I think sometimes in Colombo, we lack the, the knowledge of the regions. There is a big gap. I think the COVID is going to create a bigger gap. But Let's look at that as an opportunity where we do things differently. I think this is a great opportunity for 
a, a lot of people. It's very difficult for just one or two people to go and do this because uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, I've been doing it for 30 years and I think they consider me a very naive businessman because uh, because uh, I it's I am doing charity and not business. Okay. But then again, I think we have to be socially responsible and we have to help our our uh, fellow man uh, when and and I think this SME development, I think now that it is in conversation, we need to have some action plans down at the grassroots level for the education that is going to be necessary and also institutional capacity building beyond beyond the city. I think. Uh, uh, so Osha nicely explained that, that these regional hubs and things like that are mandatory. And uh, then only we can, you know, the, the SMEs in Sri Lanka are the most unproductive <laughs> group and there is so much opportunity. So let's hope we can work together, collaborate and get them out of uh, uh, that situation. Thanks, Suresh. I think uh, there are a number of questions which are coming through. Most recent one is, uh, Mr. Dimail, uh, the, with regard to the government strategy to achieve 100% organic agriculture, uh, which you and everyone agree is very good uh, medium uh, to long-term strategy. It is essential to have a phase-out plan for chemical fertilizers instead of an immediate haul to ensure sufficient produce will be available for consumption and export. But the organic fertilizer reduces output uh, per, per square area, which means uh, more area is needed to be cultivated, which cannot be done in the short term. Uh, he's just asking your weaves, uh, Suresh, on this. Yeah, this is this is quite complex. Yeah, I think what's necessary is there are some very successful uh, organic agriculture farmers today. And we need to like take those best practices and, and, and multiply that. You know, part of the reason that chemical agriculture has been so successful is because of the education that went into chemical agriculture. Now, if we can do the same kind of effort to, to uh, disseminate information on organic agriculture, I think, I think it can be done. I'm, I'm quite confident because I myself have been involved in, in, in converting uh, into organic agriculture. And I think that, that the way that we can do this is if everybody pulled in that direction. So let's hope that we can use the best practices that are happening in Sri Lanka and develop it. Organic inputs for fertilizer might have to be, you know, I mean, it's, a, it, it's going to be a phased out process. We, we can see that that's happening already. Okay, but if, but we must not go in the other direction. Let's somehow, you know, do what it takes to, to phase out under these conditions. Yeah. Okay. okay, I think uh, maybe a lot of other discussion uh, needs to take place as well as uh, the visualization of some of these success stories, specifically even uh, from your side as well, might help uh, to make the break some kind of uh, the barriers in the minds of the people. The sudden change sometimes it's going to be difficult for them to absorb uh, as well. uh, so in the interest of time i just move into uh, uh, the uh, oshada uh, but it's it's uh, kind of uh, you have already mentioned about it internet internet stability has been a, a problem today in sri lanka what approach should be taken to overcome this no it's a, it's a good question nandika so uh, as I mentioned, <clears throat> because of COVID, if you take, we go back and remind ourselves to April 2020, um, the exact metrics are approximate 40% uptake in traffic was there overnight because literally the whole of the nation, uh, and as Subhashini mentioned, as much as we have not adapted to digitalization, we were forced to, right? I mean, that's a good thing that came out of this because you would have been again in this archaic ages where no one wants to adapt for different reasons and egos and, uh, you know, insecurities. But when this happened, there was a stretch, you know, uh, on the, uh, the the infrastructure we had of 40%, right? Now, obviously, that had an impact on the quality of service. I should, I would admit that. Um, and then, in fact, there has been a, a report circulating around uh, called Surfshark, which has put Sri Lanka as the worst country for internet, right? I, I think almost all of our media shared it, right? But interestingly, what nobody really talked about is 
Surfshark has taken the data of the second week of April 2020. Now again, Subhashini mentioned that she has taken out the complete 2020 out because it's a disparate year, right? You can't, right? If you look at a sampling, there's no way you can look at uh, uh, April. So what the Surfshark report did was, and I have statistics on that, and I have I'm talking with great responsibility on this. They took the data of the country on the third uh, second week of April, where we just went into the uh, first level lockdown. Now, again, what the media doesn't talk about uh, this is that much, much more credible indices, right? Such as the economist, right? Indices and all of that, right? Has put Sri Lanka. So what I'm, what I'm saying is we are not the best faculty of service, neither are we the worst, right? Now, interestingly, if you take uh, the GSMA connectivity index, now GSMA is the global apex body of telecommunication service providers. Um, we are out of 170 countries. We are on the 105th position, right? If you take the Economist uh, Inclusive Internet Index 2020, if I remember, we are on the 58th rank out of 100, right? And I'm talking about 2020 reports, right? Now they've done a much more pragmatic sampling, right? That that goes through best practices. Now Surfshark, you know, has just only taken a sample of 85 countries, by the way. Now, all of the other uh, metrics that I've said, they've taken 175 countries, right? And in fact, on Surfshark, India just ranks seven steps behind us also. They're on the 78th. We are on the last 85th place. Now, um, what are we doing? Um, we are expanding very aggressively. Uh, we've ensured as TRC have ensured that uh, we've taken pragmatic steps to ensure that uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the infrastructure can be uh, fast accelerated uh, without any archaic you know, uh, uh, issues that the telcos face. For example, we've accelerated the approvals, we've accelerated the investments in tandem with the BOI, um, we've accelerated the taking off certain you know, prohibitive um, um, uh, policies that was in place. So these are all examples, Nandika, right? So I believe it's going to improve, it's going to improve. But as you would all know last year, even YouTube and even Netflix has to cut down on their high definition, um, uh, 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 high definition uh, uh, transmissions because these are global phenomena. It's not only Sri Lanka. In fact, uh, uh, US is facing this situation as well. Not an excuse, um, we need to ramp up. And I think, we, we, uh, the, I think the good thing is this, right? I mean, I'll give example. Just three weeks, uh, four weeks back, we um, switched on a tower in uh, a deep rural area called Panana in uh, Ratnapura. Uh, unbelievably, just after switching on the tower, right within the first week, there was 4,000 concurrent users on the tower. Now this tower covers about uh, four kilometer radius. Um, and and uh, the per GB download rate was about 500 GB. Now I'm talking about a deep rural Nandika, right? So I think the industry has to continue to grow. The industry has to continue to invest. Uh, there's no way around it, but I see it as a good problem. But of course, um, it's coming out. Uh, we are getting uh, another CMEV cable coming in, the CMEV6 coming in with another 4 dbps of uh, bandwidth for the country. SLT has invested on it with the, with a the consortium. Um, so I think uh, a lot of expansions are going, and I'm 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 hopeful that in a few uh, months, I think by the end of the year, we can stabilize back Nandik. But again, look, I mean, we are today having this conversation without a single breakdown, right? Of course. There is going to be issues. Uh, I admit to that, but I think it's about progressively moving forward. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I think uh, the capacity building in the telecommunication and ICT, specifically telecommunication area, is so that that is you need to have huge amount of investment as well as the infrastructure coming in place, and it takes a lot of time. We know that. Uh, now, uh, maybe uh, moving into another question. They are again uh, for you, Shadar. Uh, they, they mentioned very clearly, will there be a fiscal budget support for your initiatives to curb cyber threats and cyber crimes? Very interesting uh, question, Nandika. So as much as we go down this journey of digitalization, what we realized is, you know, um, we have a complete new realm of challenges coming in, right? Uh, one is uh, uh, the digital health and safety, uh, for example, of our children, right? I mean, more and more, we are basically exposed to uh, digital fronts. Um, in fact, first of all, October, we are celebrating the World Children's Day, and then there's a huge uh, uh, issue uh, on, on a global perspective, uh, uh, in, uh, then leaving aside the positives of digitalization. So it, it's a big yes, Nandika, because right now in Sri Lanka, this is something that I've been uh, vehemently advocating on. Uh, where we, we are at a very, very uh, bad situation in terms of our cybersecurity readiness. Uh, we only have a computer emergency readiness team, the CERT, Sri Lanka CERT. That's typically the first step a country would take. Uh, uh, on their cybersecurity readiness. But you would remember uh, last February, this year, February, in fact, even our .lk uh, root server was attacked. If you remember, the Google.lk 
uh, routed back uh, to I don't want to mention the site. Um, uh, this global terrorism, right? Um, so, so what are we doing as a country? So, um, the good news is we've just formalized the cybersecurity bill. It is going uh, coming in parallel to the cyber defense command build as well. So, what this will entail is it will ensure that we can create a cybersecurity agency for Sri Lanka. I'm talking about a best of the breed uh, knock so that we have a real time monitoring. Um, because we have to understand Nandik, as much as we keep on, hopefully, I mean, if we can succeed in this digitalization drive, uh, we need to ensure that it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's a comprehensive approach, ensuring that it's sustainable in terms of security as well. So it's a big yes, uh, we are working on it. And hopefully, um, within the next few weeks, we are looking at uh, parliamentary approval for the da draft cybersecurity bill, um, which then can go into the, uh, the legal draft once for final vetting. Fingers crossed. Thanks. Thanks also. Sheda. I think what we wanted to know is whether there will be a budgetary or the fiscal support as well coming from. Yeah. Uh, this kind so of Nandika, yes, uh, we will have to have, right? For example, we will have to have. Um, so so we've, we've allocated budget, for example, the national, uh, the NOC and all of that coming in, and it will recover heavy investments. So um, yes, we, we have sought that uh, uh, budgets, and I'm, I'm certain that that will be allocated. Uh, uh, albeit the fact that we are at a downturn, these are key imperatives we should uh, look at. So yes, it's a yes, Nandi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving into Suhashini, uh, Suhashini, uh, uh, what uh, came out is, uh, don't you think why we miss the bus in export development unlike other Asian countries is mainly because there was shortage of skilled labor in 80s and 90s in Sri Lanka. Further, labor strikes added to the problem, and our labor laws are not catering to this. That's the question. Don't you think so? Actually, I think in the 80s, if we, we actually in the 80s, we saw quite a good growth in exports purely because we had low skill, low cost labor. Our garment sector actually uh, started during the 80s. And that was the first time Sri Lanka transitioned from a primarily an agriculture export economy where tea, rubber and coconuts account for over, over you know, a good 70, 80% of Sri Lanka's exports, we transitioned into the first step, like first baby step in industrial exports is garments. Normally garments would be like the baby steps in industrial exports. So we took our baby steps in the 70s, uh, late 70s and the 80s. And the garment industry came into Sri Lanka purely because we had low cost and low skilled labor. The problem is now because we are still stuck in an industry where that was that we did well when we were a low income economy that generally relies heavily on uh, low cost, low skilled intensive. It is a low cost, low skilled intensive sector. But unfortunately, we are still reliant on it. And today we are a middle income economy, lower middle income economy, but we are uh, stuck in a sector for 50% of our exports where we don't have the comparative or the competitive advantage anymore in low cost labor. Skilled, yes, that's a big question. What East Asians did really correctly is they knew when you're transitioning from a from a low income economy to a middle income economy to a high income economy, a critical thing countries should do is upskill their labor force. They invested heavily, heavily in education. Sri Lanka totally, totally failed. I, we are still reaping the benefits of our education investments in the 50s and the 60s, where our school and all that primary education is doing well. But our higher education also was explaining about the skill shortages, even in their sectors. We have not invested sufficiently on our higher education. Uh, our higher education quality is low, and then the number of people who has opportunities is low. So definitely, Sri Lanka is in a, in a sector that still heavily relies on low cost, low skill labor, and our labor is no longer low cost. We are not competitive compared to countries like Bangladesh and others. And our own apparel exporters are shifting their uh, low cost operations lo a lot into other countries. Uh, just like South Koreans and others did when they were transitioning into middle income countries, they just realized apparel is not our future anymore. They just actually outsourced and invested in other countries and moved out. But we have not done that transition. Definitely upskilling is really, I think, I think the IT sector has been saying for a long time how important it is to do greater investments in IT education and upskilling. We definitely need to do that. But it's it's just a lot of talk, but very little walk. So it's it's the sad reality. 
<laughs> Thank you, Sajini. Uh, the, the, maybe uh, specifically, we are also mentioned the fact that uh, the, they are targeting maybe 175,000 professionals uh, during 2021, expanding into 225,000 and 300,000 by 2024. And there again, uh, we know, we are aware of the fact that a lot of startups in very, very rural areas are coming through, uh, specifically IT industry is concerned. Uh, so maybe that might add some amount of value. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Kamaratna also uh, to make certain observations and specifically from the monetary policy, uh, the perspective from the central bank uh, to uh, give uh, maybe some uh, insight. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the roadmap is going to come up and people are just waiting for it uh, very eagerly because they, they need to see some kind of a story and some kind of convincing uh, roadmap coming through. Uh, if you can just add uh, uh, in the interest of time, I think we are coming very close to 530. <clears throat> Thank you, Nandika. Uh, I think uh, it's better to wait till 1st of October uh, to listen to governor's uh, you know, roadmap presentation. But basically, uh, what I observe is, I think I truly agree with uh, many comments made by our three uh, expert panelists. But uh, I will basically focus on the current issue of uh, you know, foreign currency reserves uh, in relation to exports. So what we see is still, uh, you know, uh, the ex even though we realize numbers around 1 billion per month in terms of exports during last few months, but there is a gap in terms of cash flows. The book figures are, you know, very uh, good, but in terms of cash flows, it is not that good. So that is the gap that we want to fill. But uh, you know, even very recently, I think I think uh, we had a forum with uh, all exporters and importers to convince uh, on the exporter side how to bring in cash inflows through uh, whatever the means uh, possible so that at least we can uh, uh, reduce this particular gap. So with that only, I think we can, uh, you know, uh, sustain or address the present, uh, you know, and even future uh, foreign currency uh, problems. Uh, and also, I think uh, the, the, if you look at the pressure for foreign uh, exchange is again coming from importer side, where we have seen, uh, you know, during last seven months, somewhat higher imports even compared to the periods like 2019-20. So there we feel that uh, there is stockpiling aspect, uh, feeling that the prices, I mean, the, will go up and the exchange rate will depreciate further. So that is the other aspect which has further uh, resulted in the pressure. But hopefully, uh, I think the, the governor will present the roadmap with clear targets and indications, uh, which will pave the way to come out of this problem gradually. So we'll wait for his presentation on 1st of October. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. I think uh, the professor, is it uh, we have come at the uh, end of the session or can we have another one or two questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah most certainly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think uh, maybe one of the questions which came up is uh, regarding FDIs to Sri Lanka, changing fiscal policies time to time, with change in power in the country, discourage investors, should not we have independent commission uh, to formulate the policies irrespective of the parties in the power to boost FDI uh, to Sri Lanka. I think uh, this, this <laughs> national policy on all these kind of aspects has been there uh, under discussion for, the, for, a, for a longer period of time. And uh, still we are trying to come up with certain uh, trade national policies as well as other policies as well. Uh, uh, Subhashini, how, how we can uh, tackle this particular the, the policy inconsistency? First question, you said 
we are we are one of the the, the biggest barrier you you were said the mention about it uh, i think uh, tax policy is definitely uh, one of the most inconsistent in sri lanka and of all the taxes i think trade taxes have been the ones that have been subject to such frequent change and it really affects because the people who change are not even aware Uh, the downstream the supply chain right who is using this and for what purpose and how how they are affected so so and there is no consultation i think it's just changing trade taxes has become like a hobby of sri lankan governments and they are changed so frequently over the years and that is and i think one of the things if we are to get out of this current financial uh, current crisis both public finance and exchange uh, foreign exchange crisis we are facing i think one thing any government should realize is that you know not having a proper stable taxation policy and every election just the previous speaker said how every election you have the santa claus right So every election, every government wants to be the Santa Claus. I mean, until and unless we stop it. But independent commissions, I would like to speak. I mean, to the person who asked this question, you know, Sri Lanka somehow, Sri Lankans and Sri Lanka seems to be averse to independent commissions, right? I mean, we seem to still trust our political authorities. I don't know where the public sentiment is, but we, despite you know, numerous times how our political politicians have, you know, not. Uh, have been deceiving us we still seem to think and they do not have technical knowledge but we seem to still be in favor of abolishing independent commissions in favor of giving more power to uh, political authorities to make decisions i think independent commissions if they are not independent the way is not to abolish them and transfer the power to the politicians but actually to make them independent i think one organization that has served well is definitely the telecom regulatory commission despite i mean many bottlenecks the fact that the, the regulatory you know telecom regulatory commission it was this established as an independent commission made a big difference to the liberalization of the services sector and the growth of the services sector and i wish if the public utilities commission was as independent and competent and people with uh, uh, staffed with competent people i'm sure the many problems we are facing in the energy sector can be solved as well so so i totally agree independent commissions are very very important but i think we need to educate the people of the valley and also also create public pressure to demand for these things otherwise for the political authorities obviously they would have, like to have more power over anything Nandika, right. if I can, can I just say a few words because you Absolutely, asked about the yes. food sector. Yes. No, really, I think uh, Subhashini, of course, was talking of the maybe the more on the trade side. But if you look at the export side, I think the chairman of EDB is here. Uh, he will be able to say that uh, if the exporters are importing some product for re-export, then I think we need to really, of course, make it very easy because they don't have to pay any tax or maybe the tax is refunded. So these processes are actually applicable and. in fact we have suggested uh, like what we did earlier at the boi you have a exporter then a person a local person who supplies the goods to the exporter you treat him as a indirect exporter then he will also get the same benefits as an exporter and the other thing is now you see boi was under the uh, president earlier you know at the time president jr jayawardena set it up then unfortunately uh, midway it was uh, given over to a minister but but i am happy that now it is back with the president because i've been working with the boi when uh, 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 president premadas was there and we set up the 200 garment factories program you know it was a one stop shop uh, no interference uh, uh, going to the rural areas everything was done you know so i'm very happy that the ict agency is also under the president because uh, you can set up maybe 250 or 300 ict schools around the country because you have the authority you have the blessings from the president and that's how the way that things have to be done you know because it's not uh, because when the president says all the ministers others will have to agree you know because you can't uh, if you give it to a minister there will be so much of other interference so that's the way to go ahead you know that's why the boi was formed when the, at the time that i was boi chairman we we could uh, give recommendations to open a, a fcbu account you just take that letter and go and open you don't have to go to the inland revenue it is under the boi and customs are also are under control so i, I think uh, now uh, uh, osha de mentioned that they are going to set up the tech institutions in the country Uh, throughout the country those are going to be free trade uh, zones you know because once you have your own authority 
you don't have to worry about anything else. So that's how the country can go forward. And I'm sure I have told the chairman of the EDB also that we need to cut across everything and take it forward. And I'm sure that uh, you will succeed. Who said I'm sure you have a very great uh, opportunity. And what you said is going to be very encouraging. And we can take the country forward. You know. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Professor. Uh, I think uh, even though there are another one or two other questions, I think. Uh, Maybe time for us to conclude since we are running maybe about seven, eight minutes uh, uh, over the time as well. Uh, Professor, I think maybe uh, in conclusion, specifically when it comes to the ICT, as you also very correctly mentioned, uh, when we look at it, uh, maybe the, the pipeline, uh, it uh, drills down to so many utilities and uh, the, not only the professionals, but even uh, the number of startups and the number of uh, the things that we need to do. If we can have that kind of a very clear plan, uh, the, probably most of the things can be uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, materialized. But uh, the, maybe the serious issue is going to be change of the mindset, as uh, uh, the, the EDP chairman mentioned. The change of the mindset is going to be very, very serious issue. When it comes to maybe the I ICT uh, process, I think sometimes the people are very agile and they are quite new and they are the young blood which is coming into the, the play. But when it comes to agriculture, it is not the case. And the uh, young crowd is moving away from the agriculture, as well as they are they are moving into cert certain other things. And uh, the, the grabbing them into maybe ICT other things is going to be one of the, one of the ways to maybe move forward. Uh, of course, uh, as far as attitudes are concerned, I think we have serious issues. We always maybe try to hang on to the protection, uh, what uh, we, we enjoy, uh, uh, where the trade is, not that much encouraged as well as Suhashini Suhashini also mentioned. That is one of the issues that uh, what we have, and um, maybe uh, to be a bit uh, bold uh, with as far as the trade is concerned, uh, it's going to be extremely uh, beneficial for us uh, because when you are a smaller country of 80, 80 million or 85 billion US dollars, how can you, I mean, with the 20 million population, you cannot really move away uh, from that unless otherwise you liberalize some of the things. Of course, yes, during the pandemic, we might have to restrict some of these imports or other kind of things. Everybody has been doing it. But even when it comes to the medium and long term, uh, Professor, I really feel like most of the other economists throughout the world, what they say, otherwise we need to have maybe more than 300 million, uh, the, the, the million uh, kind of population where we have only USA, uh, the, uh, the China and India. They, they will develop otherwise see in a closure kind of situation. Uh, so uh, then uh, keeping in mind that I uh, uh, would like to maybe invite uh, Mr. Rath also uh, to uh, raise uh, some of the concerns that you observe, uh, Mr. Rath. I think, I think basically uh, during the presentations, most aspects covered in detail and also the questions raised by participants were, you know, very you know, useful. And even those were addressed to you know great extent. So I think uh, I don't have anything specific to ask uh, this moment. Probably you can conclude the session, Nandi. Thank you. Uh, so the professor, maybe in the interest of time as well as uh, since we ran it uh, maybe for more than two hours. Uh, the, the, thank you very much, professor. This is very very uh, important session as well as uh, the way that you have arranged. The, the speakers and the presentations are absolutely necessarily uh, meaningful uh, because uh, normally when we look at the trade, uh, what we need to do is we need to get away from, we need to in, uh, increase the efficiencies from agriculture to something else as well as we need to uh, look at the fact of productivity. Uh, for all that, uh, definitely in the middle, the ICT is one of the parts because we need to improve the technology and the innovation. So thank you very much, uh, Professor. I think this I think just take this opportunity to thank you. The way that you have structured even the, the session is, uh, I think, extremely important. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the uh, participants. Uh, I know all of them are very, very busy. Uh, also the, uh, uh, the Suresh and uh, Subhashini and uh, Mr. Karunatna also uh, after getting into a serious responsibility as well. Thank you very much uh, for coming down to share the uh, ideas with us. Uh, so I uh, would like to uh, hand over to Professor right. for the last uh, uh, concluding remarks.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Nandika. I think I must uh, congratulate you for a very, very excellent session. You were able to carry it, and I'm sure all your, your co-chairmen and all your uh, speakers uh, played a very, very major role. I think uh, they all uh, are really there to uh, build the, uh, our strong export economy. So I'm indeed very happy and uh, uh, that we have been able to do this. Uh, uh, especially, I must thank uh, our chairman of the EDB, Mr. Suresh Timel, Mr. Oishada Senanayaka, Mr. Subhashini Abhishekan, of course, as I said, the chairman Nandika Pudipala and uh, co-chairman Mr. Karuna Ratna. Now, tomorrow, actually, we are continuing. I think I would like to invite our chairman of the ICT agency for that session. The first session is on digital transformation for a technology-based economy. Well, I would like to especially invite you onto the panel if you have a little time. It's the same connection, so you can uh, please come on that uh, because I think uh, because that we are going to talk, talk on digital transformation, the backbone of economic revival by, by Jan Tati Silva, Secretary of the Ministry on Digitalizing Professional Education, Digitalizing University Education, then of course the impact of digital transformation on the banking sector. So if you have a, a little time, uh, uh, Mr. Oshada, we will be very pleased to see you there because that's a very, very important uh, conference. So let me also tell all our participants that tomorrow uh, we are starting at 2 p.m. There are two sessions that are there. The session two, as I said, on digital transformation for a technology-based economic revival and the fourth one on the COVID-19 responses to COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And I think uh, that would be of interest to you because uh, there are some uh, general topics that we are covering. covering. One is mindfulness practice and managing stress under COVID-19 pandemic can be on, which will be handled by Mr. Deepal Suryaji. And the other one on the emotional intelligence skills, key to navigating COVID-19 pandemic can be on. Uh, Ms. Mariam uh, Riza from uh, uh, Melbourne, Australia. And of course, CFO's response to COVID-19 pandemic can be on by Mr. Hasita Premaratma. So uh, tomorrow, I think uh, uh, we have put that for the last so that people will be more relaxed and they will gain quite a lot. So once again, let me thank all of you. I think it was a great contribution, uh, which will certainly help uh, all of us uh, in the new thinking process that will come and the new ideas that have come. And uh, wish you all the very best, Nandika. I think it was a very, very excellent session. And all our participants and our members of the council and others who were there. And uh, uh, if you are available, please uh, visit us tomorrow. Subhashini, if you have the time, certainly you're also welcome because you are a researcher. And uh, most actually, I must just tell you one story. I don't know if chairman of EDB is there. Uh, we were trying to find out the statistics of uh, exports of SME sector. He says uh, not available, you know. So that's why the data is very, very important. You know how we can get it, but I'm sure uh, OECD is there that the SME sector in the IT area will certainly uh, bring prosperity to Sri Lanka. You know? So thank you and all the very best. Uh, certainly, uh, you're welcome tomorrow also. Okay, thank you. Bye. Pleasure thank to be you. part of Thank you. Bye, Yoshana. Thanks, Mr. Ratna. Thanks, Suresh. Thank you. Okay, interface. Uh...